Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our fourth webinar in the five part series on AMR ATA. This webinar will focus on mitigation in farm production and the environment. Before we get started, I will go over some housekeeping items. You'll see at the bottom of your screen a question and answer box. You can use this box to ask questions about speakers' presentations, work, and research. You can also ask us questions about Zoom functionality. You can use the box to type your question and hit send. Um, and the speakers or moderators have the option to answer your question live out loud or type a response. Here is our agenda for the day. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Tim Widner, who will be giving opening remarks for today's webinar. Dr. Tim Widner is the USDA ARS National Program Leader for Plant Health. He is the point of contact for all USDA ARS projects related to plant health and is involved with antimicrobial resistance, soil health, and plant-related issues in ag biosecurity. In addition, he oversees the projects for the ARS-associated overseas biological control libraries, laboratories in France, Greece, Australia, Argentina, Argentina and China. Dr. Widmer has served as the U.S. representative on the Methyl Bromide Technical Options Committee since 2018. In 2000, he joined USDA ARS as a research plant pathologist until 2018, where he is in his current position. Dr. Widmer received his PhD in plant pathology at the University of Florida in Gainesville and did a postdoctoral study at Cornell University in Geneva, New York. Passing it over to you, Dr. Widmer. Thank you very much for that introduction and welcome. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, we are pleased to have over 221 registrants from 29 countries registered for the third of five antimicrobial resistance and alternative to antibiotics research webinars presented by the USDA Agricultural Research Service. As the USDA's in house non regulatory research agency, the ARS conducts research to address agricultural issues of high national priority and identifying solutions to AMR risks associated with agriculture is one of the USDA and ARS's top priorities. As an agricultural research organization, ARS is uniquely positioned to identify AMR solutions to promote animal, plant, environmental, and public health while sustaining agriculture. ARS has a strong record of solution-oriented, hypothesis-driven research that delivers innovative and sustainable solutions. ARS has a diverse, multidisciplinary workforce that conducts complex, long-term systems and longitudinal studies. ARS antimicrobial and, anti and antibiotic and, and alternatives to antibiotics research is an important part of our four national programs, animal production and protection, crop production and protection, natural resources and sustainable agricultural systems, and nutrition, food, safety, and quality. To build on existing research and formulate a cohesive, impactful approach to identify antimicrobial resistance and alternatives to antibiotic solutions for agriculture, ARS hosted a research solutions for AMR workshop in 2021. Teams of scientists heard from key stakeholders and leaders in the field of antimicrobial resistance and alternatives to antibiotics research about the state of the science and to identify industry and regulatory research priorities on antimicrobial resistance in agriculture. ARS scientific experts across the One Health spectrum animal, plant, environment, and food safety, collaborated to identify ARS priority research needs and priorities that will enhance the science and identify solutions to address our five priority areas, risk, systems biology and detection, mitigation, communications that will advance our vision, which is to be the global leader for innovative, equitable, sustainable research solutions of antimicrobial resistance in agriculture. 
and our mission, which is to promote the resilience of agriculture to antimicrobial resistance for the health and safety of animals, plants, environment, and the public through cutting edge research solutions and outreach. So over the past three months, ARS presented webinars highlighting ongoing research and had panel discussions focused on the topics. And there is one more webinar scheduled next month. Today's session will focus on the priority topic of mitigation. Speakers will discuss the development of novel intervention strategies and alternatives to antibiotics to optimize antibiotic use or reduce antimicrobial resistance transmission in farm practices. Afterwards, there will be a Q&A session in which we will be happy to take your questions and a panel discussion with the speakers. We thank you for being here and look forward to the panel discussion after the talks. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Noel Noyes, who is a veterinary epidemiologist and McKnight Land Grant Professor in the Department of Veterinary Population Medicine at the University of Minnesota. Noelle received her Bachelor's of Arts in European Studies from Amherst College and her Master's in Arts from Onsbruck Universität in Germany, while conducting independent research on an Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship. She enrolled in the DMV PhD dual degree program at Colorado State University, where she received her doctorate in epidemiology. A USDA NIFA postdoctoral fellowship and her veterinary degree was specialization in large animal medicine. Her lab investigates antibiotic resistance, microbial ecology, livestock production microbiomes, metagenomics, antibiotic use in veterinary medicine, bioinformatics, and status. Noelle, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Widmer, for the introduction and welcome everybody to the webinar today. Um, so to get us started, um, I thought this is such a complex topic. It would be nice to have um, or maybe discuss a framework for thinking about all of the complexities around this topic. Um, and so instead of putting together a primary research talk, I've put together sort of a 30,000 foot view of uh, a framework that a way we could potentially discuss um, this very complex topic. And so with that, I'm going to share my slides. Hopefully you all can see my screen now. Perfect. Uh, so the, the topic of this webinar is um, obviously antimicrobial resistance mitigation with a specific focus on farm production and the environment. <clears throat> so uh, you often hear when people talk about antimicrobial resistance, you hear this phrase, AMR is complex. And uh, I think we can all agree on that. Um, and from my perspective, because I work a lot on microbial ecology, uh, my mind sort of immediately goes to the complexity of the microbes themselves as sort of the main, uh, the main drivers of antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial resistance is, of course, a phenomenon that is um, produced by the microbes. And one of the complexities that we work with a lot um, and many scientists work with is sort of this complexity that we often don't have the technical or logistical capabilities to look at antimicrobial resistance across microbial populations. And so often we use methods that allow us to look at specific microbes of interest, um, whether that's through culture or PC targeted PCR methods. But in reality, antimicrobial resistance is, of course, a, a phenotype driven by the genotype of microbes and in many environments that we work with, particularly within farm production systems, uh, those microbial communities are extremely diverse. Um, and so in that sense, uh, the technical scientific capabilities to look at antimicrobial resistance uh, within those complex com communities um, is one of the limiting factors. But today, um, what we're really focusing on is mitigation. So not, not so much the phenomenon of antimicrobial resistance itself, but how can we mitigate it? Um, and that, of course, is the important question when it comes to animal, human, and public health. So when we think about mitigation, resistance becomes even more complex, in my opinion, um, especially within agricultural production systems. And I think the reason it becomes complex is because it's no longer quote unquote, just a phenomenon 
um, related to microbial communities, but it has all of these layers around it. It has all of these layers from our agricultural systems and their value chains, management and production practices that we employ that impact these microbial populations and the host species within them. We have to deal with host physiology and we have to deal with um, more anthropogenic um, factors such as human behavior and decision making, historical and political influences, and of course how all of these impact the microbes themselves. And so the mitigation I think um, is even more of a complex topic and it gets at least for me uh, and the way that my brain works, um, I think sometimes it's useful to put some framework around all of this complexity to understand when we're talking about mitigation, where in sort of this complex web are we really um, focusing our efforts. So this is a um, sort of very simplified um, diagram that we proposed as a way to potentially think about antimicrobial resistance mitigation. Um, and I think that, you know, no diagram is perfect, especially for complex systems, but potentially it can help us frame the discussion today when we're talking about some of these um, really um, novel, innovative ways to, to tackle AMR mitigation. So one way that, or one area where we tend to talk about mitigation is by preventing transmission of either antimicrobial resistance genes, so the ARGs, or antimicrobial resistant bacteria, so ARBs. And these, um, these mitigation efforts focus really on routes of transmission. And sometimes those routes of transmission are more well-defined like host to host or through the food chain. And sometimes as we're finding out more and more, those routes of transmission are rather diffuse um, through various environmental routes such as waterways, um, even things like wind, um, or vectors like um, birds, wild birds, and other um, potential uh, vectors of transmission. So um, this is one area where there's a lot of work in trying to mitigate through mitigation of transmission itself. I think there's another area where we can talk about mitigation, and that's mitigating through I, the word controlling is probably not perfect, but somehow managing microbial populations, right? And the, way, the reason we focus on this for mitigation is because if we can somehow predict or um, nudge or control the way that bacterial populations evolve or their ecology, we can potentially um, control the resistance profile that we see within a given environment, be that a production system, a human hospital, or wherever we're looking. Um, of course, microbes are in close contact and um, are uh, exquisitely um, impacted by the host if they are host associated microbes and also the environment. Um, so you see sort of the emergence of that epidemiological triad of the host, the environment, and in this case, not a pathogen, but the entire microbial community, which again um, is sort of the foundation for resistance patterns that we may be seeing in a given population. Uh, and so these things all sort of work together to uh, dictate the antimicrobial resistance profile. And if we could maybe somehow um, somehow control or direct ecology and evolution, potentially then we can mitigate resistance within these complex populations. So oftentimes when we are working in this area, so mitigating through this method, we talk about antimicrobial use. If we can reduce antimicrobial use, we are reducing selective pressure on these populations um, in order to try to support the persistence of susceptible bacteria. So that's sort of on the ecological side. And we're hopefully um, promoting or preventing, sorry, these populations from evolving resistance over time. Uh, and so we focus a lot on use, but uh, I think a lot of people who work on antimicrobial use and use as a mitigation tool have realized that it's really not that simple to reduce use. It sounds like it should be simple, but it's not because antimicrobial use is a human, um, it's a human behavior and it has all sorts of historical, political, social uh, and systematic sort of drivers behind it. Um, and I call those, I sort of lump those into anthropogenic drivers. Um, and so that's the, the first reason that it's, it's not that simple, right? Is that antimicrobial use is 
um, has evolved uh, as a practice over many, many decades um, as part of these very complex human systems like management and healthcare decisions, policies, regulations, and practices, and then all of the historical, political, economic, and societal context behind those things, which of course varies by geography, by country, um, and by culture. And so trying to change antibiotic use or reduce antibiotic use is actually a really challenging um, socioeconomic um, proposition, I would say. So that's the first reason that um, focusing on microbial ecology and evolution is challenging. I think the second reason is that we're finding out more and more that antimicrobial use is not the only thing that drives resistance um, from an ecological and evolutionary perspective. There are all of these other sort of mediating factors that um, also will um, ultimately um, dictate whether or not a certain microbial community has a certain resistance profile, whether that profile persists or sort of disappears. Um, and so again, on the left hand side, I'm just giving sort of a, a couple of random examples of things that can impact um, the ecology and evolution of microbes that then um, impact resistance. Um, and sometimes um, within specifically farm production systems, these um, non-antibiotic use factors can sometimes overpower um, the, the impact of the use itself. And so I just wanna give a couple of quick examples, which I think will tie in nicely to some of the talks that we'll hear today. So the first is that we know that the, the age of an animal can actually um, significantly impact the resistance profile that we see in their fecal uh, bacteria. Um, so this is a nice um, scoping review that recently um, came out on this topic. We have seen in our own work that things like infection status um, can impact significantly the resistance profile of animals. Um, and that's actually separate from antimicrobial exposure. So the viral infection itself without antimicrobial exposures um, increased antimicrobial resistance within these populations. And then recently a, a nice paper came out that looked at the association of diet with antimicrobial resistance in humans, again, showing that these non-antibiotic use factors can drive resistance. So I think that you know one, one way um, that's helpful uh, to think about antimicrobial resistance and mitigating it is again through sort of this more simplified framework. And hopefully we can use it um, today to discuss the different um, talks and, and, and ask challenging questions. Um, and then ultimately potentially guide efforts and, and guide our research focus. Um, of course, we have to keep in mind that there are many factors in this um, sort of relationship between anthropogenic drivers and the, the microbes themselves. Um, and that our um, management and uh, policy regulation practices, all of those things impact all of these mediating factors, which makes it complex. But I think part of the goal of this webinar is to dive into this complexity a little bit and understand how the system of farm production um, impacts these various things that mediate that um, eco ecology and evolution of resistance within microbes. So with that, I'd like to um, get started and um, I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Hu Ping Zhu. Uh, Dr. Hu Ping Zhu uh, has more than 35 years of academic research and industrial experience in development of innovative methodologies and mechanisms, including intelligent spray technologies to protect crops and to preserve the environment. Uh, Dr. Zhu has published more than 300 papers, including 158 peer-reviewed journal articles, and he has received 22 U.S. regional and national prestige awards to recognize his accomplishments. He is the Fellow of American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers and the recipient of the 2022 USDA ARS MWA Senior Scientist of the Year Award. He is currently an agricultural engineer and lead scientist at USDA ARS in the MWA Application Technology Research Unit. And he's also an adjunct professor um, at The Ohio State University. And so with that, Dr. Ju, I will hand it over to you. Thank you for your introduction, Dr. Noyes. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to be here today to share with you on the intelligent spray technology we developed to reduce pesticide use and to preserve the ecosystems and protect the environment. 
when we go to grocery stores, we can find that there are abundant foods to meet our needs. We can buy almost any kind of healthy and good looking fruits and vegetables in stores. As you may or may not know, pesticide spray applications actually have played very important roles in maintaining this consistent and plenty of food supplies. Even though we don't like pesticides in crop production, it is not realistic to get rid of them in modern agriculture. Without using chemicals, many of us will be starving. The question is how to precisely use pesticides to achieve sustainable agriculture. So today I will talk about <clears throat> the intelligent pesticide spray technology we developed for specialty crop production, such as fruits, nuts, grapes, and ornamental nursery crops. <clears throat> specialty crops account for about 25% of the total crop production in the United States. These crops are growing differently uh, from traditional uh, field raw crops such as corn and soybean. They have much greater uh, variations in size and shapes than corn and soybeans. To maximize pesticide spray applications, different specialty crops require different types of sprayers. And these sprayers must be equipped with large fans to uh, generate sufficient air flow to carry droplets uh, into thick canopies. These air assisted sprayers are robust and have been used to apply agrochemicals and foliar products for over 20 years. They will continue to be the primary delivery method in the next many decades because there are no cost effective alternatives to replace agrochemicals and sprayers. However, <clears throat> pesticide spray application is the most complicated process in crop production. There are so many variables affecting spray uh, quality and efficiency. These variables are so confusing and sometimes controversial. It is very difficult for growers to know how many sprayers should be used for their specific crops. So there are common practice is to use the best gas and easy to remember uh, application rates such as use 100 or 200 gallons per acre of spray solutions because 100, 200 gallons is easy to remember and easy to prepare spray solutions. And this same rate is constantly used and uh, from beginning to the end of growing season every year over again and again, regardless of crop growth stages. The application rate are, so, are also required for complicated spray calibration process. So uh, with this practice, crops are consequently and intentionally oversprayed, causing enormous uh, amount of uh, chemical loss to the air, ground, and long target areas, and resulting in pesticide waste, additional costs in crop production, spray drift contaminations to the environment in, in the air and on the ground, and all risks to and the safety and the healthy health of applicators, workers, residents, livestock, and ecosystems nearby these areas. And this, the pictures that you are seeing here is a very, very common practice for this specialty crop uh, applications of agrochemicals. <laughs> These beautiful farms uh, are always often surrounded by uh, residential uh, houses and also uh, nursing homes, schools, parks, restaurants, livestock uh, farms, water ponds, field ditches, creeks, and uh, rivers, what you can say. 
because people like to watch this beautiful farm production. Uh, but, but realistically, this pesticide you know, drift uh, contamination always get complained by everybody. Uh, to solve uh, this problem, we uh, invented a precision uh, laser guided intelligent variable rate uh, spray system. We integrated a high speed laser sensor into this sprayer to see plants and then automatically adjust each nozzle output to match plant structures in real time. This uh, spray system minimizes human errors to decide how much chemicals are needed in the field. Also with this technology, the amount of chemicals to be applied is automatically depend on how many plants are in the field and how large plants are in the field instead of the traditional constant rate flow over everywhere. So uh, this application can eliminate the excessive pesticide waste and avoid complicated uh, spray calibration for growers. And you know, we also designed this uh, intelligent spray system as a uh, universal virtual feed kit for all existing sprayers. In this way, growers can still use their existing sprayers uh, instead of uh, purchasing new intelligent uh, sprays to achieve precision application of chemicals. And spray manufacturers do not need to redesign their sprayers either because it is very expensive for growers to dispose their sprayers and these sprayers can last 30 to 50 years. Uh, the major change to the sprayer is to attach a uh, variable flow control valve to each nozzle body. So the spray capability originally designed for particular plants or crops will not be changed, but the chemicals are precisely delivered to target plants. Next, I will show you a couple of videos on this system. So these two videos shows actions of an orchard sprayer retrofit with and without the intelligent system. This is the action of the spray without the intelligent control system. You can see that uh, you can see all nozzles discharge sprays constantly a flow everywhere regardless their uh, tree size and empty uh, space in between trees. It just constantly flow you know, the chemicals into the trees. And this is the same sprayer with the intelligence control system. You can see the nozzle outputs are controlled independently by canopy architecture and presents. So this is the pulsation and also uh, like a nozzle, like a dancing with doing action. Uh, for field trials to uh, uh, to validate the technology reliability and the profit, profitability, we have had different growers, sprayers to uh, retrofit with our intelligent spray system for different crops in more than 18 commercial <coughs> industries, uh, apple orchards, peach orchards, vineyards, and also pecans in six different states across the USA. And the growers <coughs> also voluntarily test them for us <coughs> with their, their own workers, crops, <coughs> and spray programs. We really appreciate their generous support for our research. Uh, this trial started in 2013. And because for any new technology to apply pesticides, the reliability of the system is very important to growers because these specialty crop, crops can uh, worth 100 to $300,000 per acre. So uh, uh, if the 
technology is not reliable, means girls can easily lost this in the crops. So, uh, uh, so we started the trials in 2013. And, uh, field tests also showed that the sprayers retrofit with intelligent spray control system can reduce airborne uh, spray drift by 80, uh, over 87%. Uh, the airborne drift is uh, uh, the spray droplets chemicals flying in the air, not uh, landed on, uh, on, uh, on the ground. And also uh, reduce the <clears throat> spray loss to the ground by uh, almost 90 93%. And also to reduce pesticide use by up to uh, 70%. Growers who uh, participate in the trials report the, the chemical annual, annual chemical savings uh, by $56 to uh, $980 per acre. So uh, that depends on crop types uh, or location because in Ohio's you know, cost will be different from Oregon or California. Uh, but uh, with such great reductions in chemical use and also spray uh, drift loss to the ground and in the, in the air, the, uh, the uh, pest controls are still as effective as their old applications because it uses less amount of chemical solutions per acre, they can uh, spray more, more acres with the same amount of spray solutions. So it reduces tank refilling times and check the tractor uh, fuel consumption. Such great reductions in spray losses also to non-target areas also benefit the environment, uh, public and also microbial uh, eco, 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 ecologist. Uh, yeah, these two videos also show comparison for a nursery sprayer with and without uh, the intelligent spray control system. Uh, with the intelligent uh, spray control, the nodules are turned on or off automatically to match the uh, tree height. But uh, without the intelligent control, this crops are sprayed with all nozzles turned on and off because it is very time consuming for spray applicators to come out and turn on a nozzles to match tree heights. So the growers in this uh, field also report that the, the intelligent spray application uses uh, only about one third of the chemical solutions across the entire growing season in their 200 acres of field uh, compared to the pre their previous growing seasons with the uh, conventional uh, spray system. Uh, this is another uh, example of a sprayer commonly used in apple orchards to produce apples for us. Uh, this is uh, the conventional spray uh, application. And this is the intelligent spray application. And, uh, so every day, every time we go to go, uh, stores to buy apples, you will see, the apples looks are very good. But when you, uh, well, when you go to field, you will see this is how these apples were produced. produced. So this, uh, uh, this compare all this, the, the old spray system, now there are about 60% to 63% chemical reductions during a growing season, while insect disease controls remain the same. After six years of on-farm trials by commercial growers and ensured the reliability and profitability of using this new spray technology, a smart apply company in Indianapolis, Indiana, commercialized the intelligent spray control system in 2019. The commercial product is also sold through John Deere uh, network uh, worldwide. And special crop 
growers uh, in the US and many other countries are upgrading their standard destroyers with the commercial product. Crops uh, include the apples, the grapes, the cherries, nurseries, berries, hops, and pistachios, almonds, oranges, walnuts, hazelnuts, and so many. So you know, growers, they all say, you know, say this is a game changer technology for them. And it will be a primary precision spray technology for them within the next many decades to protect their crops and also preserve our environment. And this, you know, with this economic and environmentally responsible technology, growers now can comfortably spray their crops near sensitive areas such as the very nice neighborhoods and also nursing homes and also, uh, also good for uh, the soil uh, quality too. So now this concludes my presentation. I will be very happy to answer your questions you may have now or at the, pan, uh, at the panel uh, meet, uh, session. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, interesting presentation. Um, I admit I know very little about um, pesticide use in crop production, so I'm interested to hear the questions. Um, we have a couple questions, a couple of minutes for questions. Does anyone in the audience have a question? You can also put your questions in the Q&A um, if you have any. I do have one, um, Dr. Ju. Um, again, as someone who's very unfamiliar with this area, um, a lot of times when we're talking about implementing um, changes to existing technologies like this, um, I know on the animal production side, we get a lot of questions about impacts on overall production. And you have such a nice, um, you know, decades worth of, of using this um, novel technology. And I'm wondering if you have uh, measured or looked at any impacts on um, overall production uh, parameters that would be important to these different crop specialties? Yes, that's a very good, good question. So certainly uh, for growers, if when they uh, adopting uh, the new, any new technology, first, if this new technology can be uh, uh, economically benefit them. So if the technology cannot uh, bring uh, uh, cost savings of money for to make a profit of their product. Yeah, that will be very hard to uh, convince them to accept uh, this technology. And also, the, the technology reliability uh, is a hard issue. If your technology is good, but means it's not reliable, that will you know, have a big loss. Just like, like I say, for this apple orchard, for nurseries, their field crops can um, worth a uh, hundred thousand to uh, Three hundred thousand dollars per acre. So if the, you say your technology can save their hundred several hundred dollars from chemicals, uh, but compared to that, uh, the crop cost, they may not accept your technology if it's not reliable. So that's the reason we uh, develop, when we develop this technology, we need growers to try this technology in their field for over six years and make sure it uh, is working. And then, so once it's working and growers, they will use their own words to share with other growers, say this is a uh, excellent technology, reliable technology we should use. So this is the reason, and the, uh, uh, the farm equipment company also commercialized. And uh, so, so growers now can widely uh, accept this technology. Yes, that's very challenging for you know, farmers to accept new challenge if they are not, uh, reliable cannot make profit for them so great thanks so much um so now um we'll move on to our second speaker uh oh we did get a question in the chat in the q a but i think we'll save it just to stay on time um because we're now at ni uh, 9 40 eastern time so time for our second speaker but we'll definitely circle back to the um question in the q a at the end of the session all right, um, so I will um, now introduce our second speaker. Our second speaker, um, very uh, honored to introduce him, his, uh, Dr. Mark Ibekwe. 
Uh, he is a research microbiologist at the USDA ARS US Salinity Laboratory in Riverside, California. He conducts basic and applied research to identify the potential transmission routes of antibiotics and antibiotic resistance genes from wastewater and dairy manure. From wastewater and dairy manure to soil plant animal systems and develops mitigation strategies for the control of AMR dissemination. His research has many components such as metagenomics based bacterial source tracking for water quality evaluation, persistence of human enteric pathogens in the pre harvest environment, metagenomics of antimicrobials in agro ecosystems and constructed wetlands for the removal of contaminants for water quality improvement. Dr. Abekwe has 26 years of research experience with USDA ARS, and he holds a PhD from the University of Maryland College Park. And with that, I will hand over the microphone to Dr. Abekwe. All right, Dr. Lewis, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes, it looks good. Okay. Um, Good morning to everybody joining us, or uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. And my name is Mark Ibekwe, and um, I'm going to talk this morning about some of the work that we've been doing here uh, at the Salinity Lab in uh, Riverside. We are on the campus of UC Riverside, and as you can see on the screen, we have a, a very big team that is working on this uh, project. So. Most of the things that I will be presenting is not, I'm not doing them alone. It's a team from uh, Dan, who is a soil scientist, Mike Smith, who is a soil chemist, uh, George, a plant physiologist, and uh, Yuji Men from Environmental Science Department at UC Riverside, and uh, two project scientists from uh, UC Riverside Environmental Science, uh, Environmental Engineering Department that are working with us. So our concern here with the AMR is how they move around um, in the food chain. Somebody like myself that has a background in uh, microbial ecology, you just look at everything from that point of view that this thing has, doesn't happen by itself. It moved from a sewage sludge, um, wastewater, treated wastewater, manure can go that to plant and it goes through the entire cycle then it comes in contact with the human so this morning we're gonna look at our mitigation program here at use at the salinity lab from two points of view the first one is from our basic research that uh we've been doing for the past two or three years interrupted by the pandemic, which is mainly looking at and understanding the role of earthworm in the antimicrobial mitigation. When you are in a soil environment, you have a lot of earthworm. So how do these earthworm survive and live there forever and come in contact with soil 24-7? So our second part of the project will be looking at the use of biochar in polishing wastewater that has already been treated. But you know, the common practice here is the treated wastewater is not 100%. All the contaminants are not removed, especially those that are used for irrigation. So how do we get that better? and cleaner so that farmers can use and we don't have to transfer all the uh, chemicals of concern to soil, to plants, and back to human. So coming back to the first study that uh, we did looking at at home. So right before the pandemic, we set up an uh, experiment where we say, so, okay, let's see what happens within the food chain, how these contaminants of emerging concern, how they move from treated wastewater to plants 
and maybe to earthworm and possible to higher up animals. So we went to a wastewater treatment plant here in Southern California and collected some uh, wastewater and did some, uh, what we may call the suspect screening to see exactly what are some of the emerging contaminants that we have in the wastewater. And we set up this study where we have control and some with wastewater and some with um, wastewater spike with three antibiotics uh, at 10 ppm concentration and at a uh, 100 ppm uh, uh, on 10 ppb concentration and 100 ppb concentration because our idea was that once we did the suspect screening the concentration of these compounds in the treated wastewater that we collected were very very low so some of the findings after six weeks or eight weeks of a planting was that the amount of these antibiotics, the three antibiotics that we use for the study from our, our screening was tremosoprene, and the second one was sulfur metatazole, and the third one was sulfur paradine. So these were the three antibiotics that we found in our wastewater at very low concentration. And based on this uh, finding, what we observed was that the concentration of antibiotics in the soil from the control and from the soil as collected to the wastewater, we didn't find any of those in, in the soil that we used for this study. But when we look at it further, we notice that trimotoprim had a higher concentration in the soil than the sulfur compounds. This was mainly due to the longer half-life of trimotoprim that we have in soil. And when you look at the concentration in the plant materials, mainly in the edible in the edible portion of the plant materials, you see the same trend. Uh, you have those from uh, the control and as treated wastewater. Without, we couldn't detect anything from the three antibiotics, except once those that we were spiked with. 10 ppb and 100 uh, ppb, both with spinach and uh, with the uh, radish. So the next thing that we were concerned was, how is this happening? What are the processes here? Then we found out that during the study that you have a lot of antibiotics detected in the edible portion of the plants, especially with radish or with the spinach than with the radish. So this was mainly because greater uptake by spinach by spinach, likely a result of its more extensive root system. As you can see it here, spinach has a lot of extended root system throughout the but as compared to radish. Radish, because radish just has a tab root. And uh, despite that the edible portion of radish is buried inside the soil, but you don't have as much antibiotic residue in the radish tuber as you have on a spinach uh, leaf. So that means that if you are in an area where there is a potential contamination, so you may have uh, spinach because of the root system uh, taking up residue of antibiotics than uh, um, radish. Then when you look at what happens when you feed 
these plant materials, because this was the second part of the study where we actually fit the plant materials to earthworm, and also at the same time, spike this some of the plant materials with one milligrams and 10 milli, milligrams per gram of the three compounds. We also noticed that the same trend followed. We did not detect um, these compounds with the control, the treated wastewater, and even with treated wastewater with um, with 10 ppm with 10 ppb uh, spike into the plants when we were growing them. So we were beginning to see the effect of earthworm on our part of our data. And the only area that we didn't see was when we spike the plants materials once we harvested them because there was just not enough time. So the question then becomes what happens? What has what happens to the soil? What happens to the earthworm gut? So we took out the earthworm at the end of the experiment, um, extracted fecal material from the earthworm and did some more uh, shotgun sequencing from the figure material from the soil and from all the plant materials. This picture here just gives you a little bit of a, an idea of some of the antibiotic resistant gene classes that we detected from uh, these samples. You can see with radish or uh, with the spinach, you have a lot of genes detected, especially from soil and uh, rhizosphere area compared to what you have up in the upper part portion of the figure, which is mainly from the earthworm um, fecal material or from the earthworm gut. Then when you get to radish, you see the same thing. You have a lot of um, these genes detected here in the soil, but once you move to the earthworm part of the study, you have fewer amount of um, the genes detected. This is part of the work that we are still working on in terms of doing some additional uh, analysis. And the, some of the standard work that we did here was also shown by the actual microbial, um, by the actual bacteria that were involved in some of these uh, activities that we can see here. So from the earthworm um, in spinach, and you have fewer activities with the radish. So what happens here is that what we observe is that microbial community in the earthworm gut has a lot to do with what happens with the antimicrobials in the soil and with what happens with antimicrobials in the earthworm gut. That there is a lot of detoxification uh, in the earthworm gut and also formation of new microbial communities that are involved in degrading some of these uh, compounds, both in spinach and in uh, radish. So for the first part of this study, what we believe is that the earthworm gut has a lot of changes that is going on in the uh, microbial community once they get into the earthworm community. So this is part of the work that we are still working on using quantitative uh, PCR. And 
the second part of this study was actually is actually what Dan, our soil scientist, and uh, Mike, our soil chemist, has been working extensively on, which is using the biochar policing system for the remo for removing antibiotics and other emerging contaminants from treated waste water. This is something that uh, we are extremely very, very encouraged because of the kind of result that we've been getting from this uh, study. Um, I don't really want to go through this slide again because this is what we've already been talking about, um, the need to have clean treated wastewater to, for agricultural production. So that is basically what that slide is all about. And why are we using the biochar polishing system to remove antibiotics from more treated wastewater? This is because we need additional treatment. Because when you have treated wastewater, you still have a lot of contaminants or emerging chemicals of emerging concern that are not completely removed. So we use Boucher because Boucher has a very strong absorbing capacity. And uh, especially the sand voucher system, which we use that is very, very effective. So when we set up this study, this is the basic setup that we had in a, a control room. Um, we have a mixture of antibiotics from here, pump in through HPLC pump. This is the inlet we did an upward flow system here, and this is the outlet, and it comes out of here, and we collected the effluents um, daily just to make sure the amount of antibiotics residue that have come out of here, and we collected from the different layers here of sand, soil, gravel, and voucher. We collected those every two, two weeks, and we measure the concentration of these compounds using a LC-MS. Um, the next two slides is some of the work that uh, Mike Smith, our soil chemist, has been doing because not, a, not, not all vouchers are equal. We've played around with a few vouchers we noticed that not all of them are equal. We started this thing with dairy manure voucher because we have a lot of dairy manure here. And we had a company that was producing dairy manure voucher. So we started working on that. And uh, not only that, we also had to look at the pyrolysis temperature. That means at what temperature are we going to have the best quality voucher? for absorption of uh, um, antibiotics. So this is the work that Mike did. And, uh, and the goal here was really to study better, to make a better understanding of influence of um, feed stocks and pyrosy temperature on voucher properties and absorption mechanism. So all these were done in-house. Um, we have a lot of uh, pistachio shells. These are things that we throw away once pistachio are harvested. They are not really useful anymore. So if you can turn that into something useful, that's great. The same thing with the animal manure, dairy manure. If you can turn that into something useful, great. And uh, we also have some dead palm pit stuff. We have a lot of dead palms here in Southern California. So instead of throwing that away, if we can turn that into something useful, oh my God, that's wonderful. So you move that into pyrolysis process at 400, 600, and 800 degrees Celsius, and you have the result here. And from there, you move on and look at the processes. And all this in the absorption capacity is basically based on cation exchange. And uh, 
especially for those compounds that are negatively charged, like some of the sulfur compounds and the trimetoprene, which is a neutral compound. And the distribution is basically based on a, uh, hydrophobic of the properties of the voucher itself. So when we went back to the original work that we started, we observed that for the different compounds that we use, the process was able to degrade 90% of amoxicillin. It was also able to degrade 55% of sulfur diazin. That was very, very disappointing because we thought that we would get better um, degradation than that. But the chemists, they know their reasons for that. And also for tetracycline, we were able to degrade about 96% of the compound. So all this that we're having here is a product of a uh, half-life of these compounds, how long they are retained in soil, and also some of the properties of these compounds, because how these compounds interact with voucher plays a very important part in their absorption in uh, and their degradation. And finally, in conclusion, what we observe here is that as tested, the system was very effective at the removal of amoxicillin, sulfalacine, and, and tetracycline, but less with sulfadiazine. And uh, as we optimize the system, we keep on changing the flow, the hydraulic retention time. That also helped in the degradation of this compound. So the relation within the system was primarily lost pathway of most of the uh, compounds. So where do we go from all here? What we are hoping to do in the future is get all this system and try to look at the different genes, how the resistant genes are actually if they are degraded or what happens to the different processes. So we look at assessment of antibiotic resistant development within the system. We will also continue to look at application of the system to water containing antibiotic resistant bacteria, antibiotic and antibiotic resistant genes, and the use of outdoor wastewater. We hoping to use different grades of wastewater for this project, not the one that we used that was a very good clean wastewater because it's not every localities, not every rural areas, not every county has the kind of wastewater that we got here in Southern California that we use for this study. And finally, we hope to upscale this process uh, and use field scale process to actually evaluate our study. And this figure here shows the last thing that we are doing in preparation to move it from a lab scale to a field scale. So this one here, we'll move this one uh, very soon into the greenhouse so that whatever comes out of here at the end, we will be able to use it and we get crops in the greenhouse. As you can see, we have redefined this and only use voucher, different voucher with dairy manure at different pyrolysis temperature and uh, to remove most of the antibiotics and uh, we've been able to remove uh, about 100% of most of the antibiotics that we use once we get the parasite temperature to uh, 80 degrees or to 800 degrees Celsius. 
And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckway. I just want to remind the audience that if you want to ask questions, you're welcome to put them into the uh, Q&A box there at the bottom of your Zoom. We did get one question and um, we're going to save it um, until the end because we're out of time right now and need to move to the next speaker. But um, for the anonymous attendee who asked the question about antibiotic solubility, we will get to that. Um, we just want to stay on time here um, according to the agenda. So thank you so much, Dr. Beckway. Thank you. It is my pleasure now to introduce our third speaker today, Dr. Ade Oladiende is a research microbiologist at the U.S. National Poultry Center Research Center in Athens, Georgia. His research is focused on the reduction of foodborne pathogens and antimicrobial resistance in pre-harvest poultry production environments. Dr. Ola Dende works with a diverse team of scientists from USDA ARS, universities, and industry to develop multi-pronged approaches for characterizing, understanding, and mitigating the transmission of antimicrobial resistant foodborne pathogens commonly linked to human consumption of chickens. Dr. Ola Dende's current research role is to find, characterize, and apply beneficial commensal bacteria as an alternative to antibiotics for the reduction of multidrug resistant salmonella in broiler chickens. His research has been focused in, has been featured in the American Society of Agronomy News, the American Society for Microbiology News, USDA ARS News, and Poultry Focus Newsletters. He received his PhD in Environmental Health Science from the University of Georgia in 2017 and was a student contractor with the U.S. Environmental Pro Protection Agency from 2011 to 2017. Dr. Ola Dende joined ARS in 2018. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ola Dende, and I will hand it over to you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Noyes. Um, and thank you to the Office of National Programs for inviting me to give this talk. Um, like Dr. Noyes said, I'll be talking about um, our research on how to limit the horizontal transfer of antimicrobial resistance through direct failed microbials, or some other people, some people call um, probiotics. I think I should, I'll go ahead and introduce my unit and tell you a little bit about the CRIS project we are working on. Um, I work with the Egg Safety and Quality Research Unit in Athens, Georgia. And our CRIS project is focused on reduction of foodborne pathogens and antimicrobial resistance in poultry production environments. So most of what I'll be sharing is about broiler production. Uh, we have three SYs, three scientists. Um, I'm one of them and we have Dr. God and Dr. Rockrock. Most of our work has been is focused on the pre-harvest area. And this area shaded in blue is where most of, of the um, objectives of our projects is focused on. Um, Dr. Gerd and Dr. Rotrock are looking at factors within the atri and the brood phase that can that can induce serotype diversity. And Dr. Rotrock is doing some biomapping of the atri. Uh, my work is focused on identifying and characterizing and also applying probiotic commensal microbes as an alternative to antibiotics to reduce salmonella prevalence. And one last part of the objective of our, of our Chris is look at environmental and management drivers of pasture-raised chickens. And that is where Dr. Rod Crook's research is focused on. So just to reiterate, um, our project is focused on this blue area here, and my own work is focused on what happens from the grower house or to um, before it gets to processing. So that um, I would like to kind of use one study. And so this is just one study. So there are several limitations to just give you an idea of what the magnitude of the problem of AMR is in, in pre harvest and broiler chickens. And I'll be focusing on salmonella here. So this project, the objective of this project was to understand the interactions between pre harvest management practices, pathogens, indicator bacteria, and the litter microbiome. We do have several sub-objectives within this project, but for this particular talk, I'm just gonna focus on one sub-objective. And this sub-objective is to determine the prevalent salmonella serotypes, their antibiotic susceptibility profile, and the determinants, what are the, resist what are the genes, or what, are the, what is the genetics behind this development of antibiotic resistance. For this project, we looked at, we're working with one farmer that's an integrated farmer. Um, 
she practice, um, the farmer practices conventional grow out and reuses the leader for from flock to flock. Um, the leader in this house has been used for over 10 years. In between flocks, uh, the farmer applies the acid, I mean, applies iron to acidify the litter. And basically the goal is to reduce the ammonia content in the litter. For this project, we, we did sample the house, we sampled the two houses, the litter is two houses for five flocks. Um, this is the layout of the front of, of each of the houses. Um, the houses, we, we divided the houses into about four to four sessions. Um, in each section, we had two, sam two sampling points. Um, so for the sampling, we took, for each of the sampling points, we took nine grab samples. So the blue line is the water line, here is the chicken feeders. So we go all the way across and grab the grab sample from each area here. So from each sampling point, we get nine grab samples. In total, for each house, we have eight whirlpool bags. And for each event, for each sampling event, since we have two houses, we have 16 bags that we get that we go that we go back to the lab with. For the sampling schedule we did, um, our goal here was to be able to get samples before the farmer, before alum is applied, after alum is applied, during the early life of the birds, so within one to two weeks, and before the birds go to slaughter, so within two, one to two weeks before the birds go to slaughter. For this, for this, for this study, the downtime, so the time when the birds were off before another flock arrived was between 11 to 20 days. Uh, the grow duration was between 38 to 39 days. So in total, we had about 15 sampling events and 240 pooled litter samples. This experiment was focused on the litter. So I'm just gonna show the basic procedure we use in processing the litter. So each bag that has nine grab samples, <clears throat> we take about 100 and we take 30 grams of them. We had 120 mil of one XPBS, one buffer, phosphate buffer saline. Uh, we shake it for about 10 minutes at 450 RPM. Then this LOA here is what we use for all our microbiological analysis. I will only share the result on the salmonella. We do have results on pH, moisture, and other environmental parameters, but I will just focus on the salmonella here. So here on the y-axis is the percentage of litter samples that said that tested positive for salmonella. On the x of the year is what we have, what I call the broiler age stand slash downtime. So F1 here means flock one, the birds were 38 days when we sampled it. Here when you have pre and post alum, that's the downtime. So if you look in here, so for this first flock here, at 38 days, all the samples tested positive for salmonella. Then when we go to downtime, we got the numbers reduced significantly. Uh, alum was applied here, but even after alum application, by the time we get again to day, when the birds were 15 days old for flock two, we were getting to 80% prevalence. By the time we got to 36 days, when the birds were about to go to slaughter, prevalence jumped again to 100%. So the overall message here is that um, the salmonella prevalence declined below the limit of detection. And during downtime, or prevalence returned to pre-downtime levels by the end of grow out for each flock. And that's what you will see throughout here, that is the same cyclical behavior. Um, when we started getting to flock three through five, we did see that the prevalence was higher in house four compared to house two. We still, we've not done much statistical analysis to be able to identify why is that, why is that so? But the message is that even with during downtime or applying alum, by the time the birds are ready to go to slaughter, prevalence of salmonella goes jumps to 100%. So we did do some traditional server identification. Um, what you have on the x-axis is the different servers that we found by traditional methods. Um, and this is the percentage of isolates that, that belong to that server. Uh, what you see is mostly we had Infantis, Kentucky, and Typhimurium. Those are the major servers we found. When you break that down by houses, um, you see here that it was more likely that we found infantis in house two, um, typhimurium in house four, 
Then Kentucky was kind of similar, like similar prevalence in both houses, which kind of support what you see in the, in the literature. Then when we look at the antibiotic susceptibility of this isolate, uh, what you see is that, so it's the same y-axis, the percentage of isolate, salmonella isolate on the y-axis, and here on the x-axis, you have the number of antibiotic drugs. Each isolate was resistance to two or seven antibiotics. Um, you see there that for the two, for the isolate that were resistance to two antibiotics, they're mostly found in house, house four, while the ones that were resistance to six to seven were found mostly in house, house two. If you want to take a deeper look and look at what are the antibiotics this, this salmonella isolates are resistant to, um, you find out that it's mostly tetracycline and sulfonamide, um, which is also what you see as so it's most likely you find those resistance in house two compared to house, house um, and in house four compared to house two, while the other resistance, like nalidixic and chlorophenic hold, you find them mostly in house, house two. One other thing we wanted to see was to uh, like with the um, sub objective was to see what is the resistant determinant is it plasmid is a mutation that is responsible for this for this um, antibiotic resistance that we are that we are observing. So we took about 12 isolates, we selected 12 isolates based on serotypes. How we did a long reset, long read sequencing using PacBio. And there are two take home messages from this analysis that I would like to share. The first thing is based on the previous slide I showed, I showed you different serotypes here, but that was done through traditional serotyping. So what we found was that we did, based on traditional serotyping, all this serovirus was misidentified because through whole genome sequencing, we found out that they were all infantis. So the major isolate that we sequenced were all infantis and typhomerium, so nine infantis and three typhomerium. Um, in terms of the Determinant uh, for the infantis, um, all of them carried this plasmid of imagined salmonella infantis, and that was what was responsible for the six to seven antibiotics that they were resistant to. Um, for typhomerium, it was either ink C plasmid or ink C plasmid with ink I1. So the take home here is that when we look at based on this study, horizontal gene transfer of multi drug resistant plasmid was the main driver of resistance in salmonella. So that kind of gives us, tells us that yes, there is multi-drug resistance in pre avis and horizontal transfer is a major way they're getting it. So can we stop, can we limit, can we reduce horizontal gene transfer? Uh, one way that we can do it, like Dr. Noyes mentioned, is to stop using antibiotics, remove antibiotics. And from what she also said, that is complicated. And sometimes even when you reduce it, horizontal gene transfer is still gonna happen because there are other pressures, the selective pressures that will make that happen. One way scientists have been doing this is to kind of stop cell-to-cell -cell contact. So don't allow these bacterial cells to come into contact to transfer plasmids. Um, one compound that's commonly used for that is what we call conjugated fatty acids that helps that inhibits type four secretion systems. Uh, one advantage of that is that this conjugated fatty acid, they can be specific to a particular plasmid incompatibility group. And also it does not kill the bacteria. So the bacteria just inhibits the transfer. It doesn't kill the bacteria. One disadvantage or the cons of that is that it can be expensive uh, to sit and size conjugated fatty acid. We've done something like that. And it cost about, for this particular compound to HDA, it costs about 600 to $700 to, to sit and size about 100 milligrams. Also, we don't know about their safety and efficacy in the field or in animals. Another form of transfer that we always worried about is also transfer um, linked to bacteriophages, what we call transduction. Um, this has been shown in multiple ways that sodium citrates can chelate um, magnesium and calcium ions. These two compounds are very, very important for bacteriophages to attach. So when you put sodium citrate, you have less attachment from bacteriophages. Um, it's very it's a cheap way to do it. It has been shown to be effective in stopping P1-like bacteriophages. But the problem is non-specific is that it's non-specific. That means it can also stop other important bacteriophages 
and also stop and which can become important cellular processes. So the conjugated fatty acid, the safety and efficacy is unknown in the field. So the approach we have been taking is the approach we've been taking is using commensal bacteria. So if we can reduce cell to cell contracts through competitive exclusion. And the idea is that if we have a multi-drug um, strain, bacterial strain here, and you can bombard it with commensal bacteria, that will limit the access this recipient has to this multi-drug resistance strain. So this um, hypothesis came about when we started, when we did this study where we, where we raised uh, broiler chicks on fresh pine shavings and we raised some other one and we used leader. That means um, broiler leader that has been used over several flocks. And then we challenged, we challenged the birds with some uh, inalidicate resistance, Salmonella Heidelberg. Then after two weeks, uh, we utilized the birds and we look at the, this, the antibiotic resistant profile of the Salmonella isolates and the sicker and the leader. So here on the y-axis, you have the percentage of salmonella isolates, and there we have where they came from, either from the sicker of birds on fresh leader or reused leader. And the word I want to just want to take your attention to is this red bar. Um, for all the isolates in this um, belonging to this red bar, they acquired resistance to gentamicin, streptomycin, and tetracycline. But if you look at reused leader, we don't see that. We don't see them acquiring resistance, this resistance to these multiple antibiotics. Likewise, if you look at the leader too, you see this red ball also showing that the isolate that we recovered from the leader of fresh bird or birds on fresh leader, we see that they acquire resistance to gentamicin and streptomycin. While when we look at the birds on and the, the leader of birds on reused leader, we do not see that. When we went further and looked at the microbiome of these birds and see what is what can we is there any correlation is there any link between the microbiome of these birds and what we are seeing in terms of antibiotic resistance so here each bar here represents a unique strain or a unique sequence and what you find that for the birds on, on on fresh leader when we group all these different unique sequences we group them into three bacteria families on the other side, if you look at birds on reused, leader, on reused leader, when we group these sequences, they go into 10 different families. And this kind of tells us that they, the, the, the microbiome in the, in the, in the birds and reused leader is more diverse than what we are seeing in the birds and fresh leader. Um, we've published this work in ASM journals. And so if you're interested in reading more about it, you can look it up or you can shoot me an email. So based on that study, uh, we started looking at, is there a way we can perturb this beneficial commensal bacteria from reuse leader and isolate them and use them as a, as a, as a pro leader biotic? So the way we've been doing this is we've been doing macrocosm experiments with reuse leader. So we have reuse leader and this is macrocosm. Then we inoculate with multiple strains of either Salmonella Eiderberg or Salmonella Integritidis. Then we monitor, we monitor through time. So I'll give you an example. This is an example of one of those studies. So here on the y-axis, you have the salmonella hydrobird concentration in the leader. Then these are the days of incubation. But my focus here on this slide is just to, is this arrows here. So when we did the same experiment reusing reused leader from three flocks, we start seeing a bloom in bacillus species from day one after we inoculate salmonella hydrobird. When we do it with a leader from one flock, we, start see, we started seeing this bloom in bacillus species at day 14 or day, on day 21. Um, on the right here, we have a picture of, of, of this bacillus species. Um, my, the black arrows are pointing to the bacillus species and the green arrows are pointing to the salmonella strains, um, the salmonella isolates there. And it goes back to the idea of trying to bombard, bombard them with this beneficial microbe. So if we think, if we, if we assume that this is a multi-drug resistant salmonella, it's going to take some work for it to be able to have contact with this recipient here. And it's the same approach on this other slide. This is another strain of bacillus. Right? <clears throat> and it's the same approach, is the same hypothesis here that if we have a resistance strain here, it's going to take a while for it to take more work for it to be able to have contact. With this recipient, uh, we've also published some a part, some part of this work in the Journal of Environmental Quality. 
So um, what we have done also here is that we have sequenced, we did whole genome sequencing to characterize this bacillus species that we, that we isolated from these microorganisms. And they fall into two groups. Um, one belongs to the bacillus subtilis, and one is bacillus velisensis. Through whole genome sequencing, we were trying to identify how safe are these, are these microbes? Do they carry antibiotic resistance that will be transferred to the microbiome of chickens, which is not what we want. So we've done this through whole genome sequencing. And what we found out is that for the subtilis strains, they either carry the plasmid, which is kind of worrisome, or they carry antibiotic resistant genes on the mobile genomic pylon, which means that they can move around when they get into the, into the microbiome of the chicken. So that was a kind of a red flag for us. When we looked at the Bellocillus velisensis, what we see is that they do not carry this antibiotic resistance in mobile genetic, on mobile genetic elements, which means that they are less likely to move around and they, are, they pose less hazard or less risk. So we selected these ones I've called Lit My Cheek 1, 2, 3, 4 to move forward with. And this is some of the characteristics of the strains that we're trying to develop into pro lethal biotics. They are aerobic, gram positive. They belong to phylum pharmacrates. Their pan genome, they consist of these four strains are between 3,000 and 3,000 to 3,757 3, genes. They can survive extremes of temperature and pH. I will show some of that result. They belong to the same bacillus group with subtilis, um, about 76% similarity between them. We have confirmed that they do have gene clusters that produce non ribosomal peptides, polyketides, bacterial scenes, and, and, and terpenes. We've also done antibiotic susceptibility testing on them. Um, they were susceptible to the 19 of the 20 antibiotics we tested. Um, they were resistant to lipomycin. Um, B. velozensis is included in the European Food Safety Authority as a, is qualified as, he has this presumption that it is safe, that it's a safe um, bacillus strain. Um, here I will try, I will share some of the in vitro characterization we've done with, with these strains. Um, we've looked at them, how do they survive in acid? So what we did is that we exposed them to filter sterilized acidified liter extract at pH two for two hours. Here is the result. Here you have a change in absorbance. That's the change in absorbance from when before we expose it to acid and after we expose it to acid. And what you observe here is that some of them can actually grow under this pH, while some of them there's no change in metabolism or there's no change in growth. Um, the ones in the box in red and the one boxed in blue, those are the isolates that, was, that we're moving forward with. Also, we've looked at their survival at high temperatures. Here is the, so what we did here is we grilled them in Luria Betani Miller for 24 hours. Then we each shot them for 20 minutes at 80 degrees. Um, two things you'll pick up from this figure is that they do have different survival. The, three strain, the four strains have different survival under um, each exposure. Um, also, what you see is that after we expose them to E, there is an increase in the vegetative cells growing. So this also shows that this, this strains, uh, they, they, they fit into the criteria for us to be able to use in a broiler house. Um, one last thing we also did was to see um, if we inoculated these this strains into reused litter that was top dressed with fresh pine shavings, what is their survival here? So what we did here was we applied this lick my chick. We applied them at the rate of 10 to the 6 per gram of liter. Uh, we incubated them at 37 degrees at a relative humidity of 60%. Then we used the qPCR and primers that targets just this strains, B. velisensis. So on the y-axis here, you have the gene copies per gram of liter and the days of incubation. Um, the open box, the open bars is the control that we did not inoculate B. velisensis. So what you see here is that they, they, they are surviving well in, 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 in leader. And the peak, the peak that's three days, which kind of tells us that when we go to the farm, after three days, we've applied Leap My Chick, it's, that's where you have abundant numbers of them, then you can put the birds in there and they can start pricking and eating Leap, Leap My Chick. This is the last result I will, I will share here. And this is the, the crux of the story that does this. B. velisensis can they reduce antibiotic resistance? So the way we've done this is 
we've used E. coli as our donors of antibiotic resistance and Salmonella adderberg as our recipient. So we use three E. coli stain carrying transferable in high complex plasmid as our AMR donors, then three antibiotic susceptible S. adderberg strain as our AMR plasmid recipient. Then we're using a mixture of B. valesensis strains to reduce conjugated plasmid transfer. And this is just a diagram to show what is happening here. So we have each of these E. coli donors, they have several resistance genes here. Um, so the three of them will combine them, put them in a tube. The susceptible strains, they do have like small co-plasmids, but none of them carries antibiotic resistance. So we have our recipient strains. Then on the solid agar, we kind of impregnate the solid agar with a five hour growing culture of B. velisensis. So we have the five hour growing culture, then we inoculate E. coli followed by, we inoculate Salmonella Heidelberg followed by E. coli. We let that grow for 18 to 24 hours. We take, scrape all the colonies, then we severely dilute on silo, silos deoxychelate agar that has either septraction in it or has gentamicin in it. The first result I would like to share is just to show you the total of Salmonella Adelberg that, that survived. So here is the abundance in CFU per agar plate. Um, and what you see here is that this is the ones, this is the plate that has lick my cheek and this is the control. So what we observe here is that B. valensis was able to reduce the total Salmonella Adelberg population available for conjugated like cell to cell contact with E. coli. Then when we start looking at the conjugation efficiency of this Inkai plasmids, um, when we look at it for Limai chick, what we observe is that for every million equalized donor cells, about less than one cell of S. Heidelberg will likely acquire um, multidrug resistance. However, for the control, we start seeing about 47 Salmonella Heidelberg are gonna acquire um, resistance when you have a million cells of E. coli donors. So this shows us that this B. valensis does have the capability to reduce conjugation efficiency. And just so you know that all the transcodigans that we have from the AST and from this study, uh, they acquired resistance to ampicillin, ceftraxion, and tetracycline. So what are the current or future directions? Um, we plan on we have plans in place and we're gonna start, we have our dates ready. We're gonna do, we're gonna start with three trials to determine the safety, the efficacy and the performance of these direct fed microbials in pre and post harvest. Uh, we have established uh, a, a crater with um, Calpis America. They are the major producer of a B subtilis strain that's being used by the industry. And it's also uh, has been approved by the European Food Safety Authority. So they will be working with us for the next five years. I would like to give kudos to the Office of Transfer Technology because I did not know what was going on, but they, they, they did help me through. Um, we have partners from this project involves a lot of people, USDARS for sure. Then we have people from Colorado State, University of Georgia and Tennessee. And like I said, um, the industry, Calpis America, AH Pharma and Face Genomics. Face Genomics is doing a lot of the metagenomics work we'll be doing this project. Um, I would like to, our funding source is coming from the Office of um, national programs, we did get some money from them. We have got some money from Soybean, United Soybean Association, and also the Calpis America and AH Pharma. They are funding their own aspect of the study. Um, the goal here is the impact is to develop a defined, safe, beneficial, and effective tailor, leader tailor direct fed microbial that, that can be used for salmonella enterica control. So I think that I will stop right here and I'd like to thank all the people that participated in one way or the other for this presentation or this story that I've shared with you and say thank you and I will take questions. Thanks so much. There are some questions in the Q&A um, and Dr. Olajande could answer those if he wants by typing, but we're going to move on to the last speaker in the interest of time. Um, and if Dr. Olajande does not um, answer those by typing in the Q&A, we can um, address them orally at the end during the panel Q&A. All right, so our last speaker today is Dr. Jim Wells. Um, Dr. Jim Wells is a research microbiologist at USDA ARS at the US Meat and Animal Research Center. He has conducted uh, food safety pre-harvest research with cattle and swine um, at the Clay Center in Nebraska since 2002. 
Dr. Wells was trained as a gastrointestinal microbiologist, and at U.S. Mark, uh, he has conducted studies to determine how animal management decisions impact the gastrointestinal colonization and fecal shedding of foodborne pathogens. In addition, the studies have also considered how these pathogens persist in the animal production environment and how they contribute to the transmission of foodborne pathogens to food and water. So with that introduction, um, I will pass the stage to Dr. Wells. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to use this to cover a variety of works that we've done, uh, concentrating mostly on the published work uh, that's come from some of the research here, and then touch up on some of the ongoing work and some of the un unpublished work as, as well. So I've been with ARS just a little over 20 years, and when I was first hired uh, here at Clay Center, uh, I was hired in the nutrition unit, and I partnered with a uh, nutritionist, partic one in particular, Dr. J.T. Yin, who has since passed away, but Dr. Yin was very, very useful. Uh, he was a, a swine nutritionist, and he had a, a large interest in, in identifying alternatives and, and, and doing things as proactively as uh, for the swine industry, even in 2002, uh, before, before um, a lot of our antimicrobial uses got restricted. Uh, but as you know, and in those conversations and stuff, it, it's very apparent. And I think uh, Dr. Noyce had talked about this earlier. You know, we've been using antibiotics in animal agriculture uh, around the world in this country for nearly seven decades. And even as early as 1978, uh, the American Congress started seeing, you know, or started uh, looking at some of the con uh, concerns about effects of antibiotics in animal agriculture. And over the course of time since then, uh, we've seen uh, the regulatory bodies step in and, and be more stringent about antibiotic use in animal agriculture, uh, starting in 1993, uh, all the way up to the uh, veterinary feed directive rule uh, that came about in 2015, 2017, when it was, everything was finally implemented. And since, you know, in the last seven years or so, uh, we have seen that antibiotic use in and feed and water, particularly those antibiotics of human uh, concern or human use concern, that has changed dramatically. Uh, you know, when we look at antimicrobial use, you know, it, there are multiple things that we historically have used and continue to use it for. Uh, we use it. Uh, we still have the capabilities to use it to prevent uh, potential disease incidents. Uh, we also have it uh, as a mechanism to uh, mitigate outbreaks uh, within a herd as disease is breaking. Also, you know, fortunately, we still have the capabilities for therapeutic use when animals are sick with disease to improve their health and well-being. Uh, where the restrictions have come about has mainly to do, you know, those that uh, where we need it to improve animal growth and feed efficiency. Uh, there, it, it is very strictly uh, prohibited, except for a few classes of, of antimicrobials. And then the other one, you know, I'm at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center, and when we when we wean pigs with within the American production system, uh, you know, I will describe it as the dysbiosis, and we will just talk a little bit about that. And here, you know, a lot of the veterinary feed directives also uh, impacted, you know, uh, the capabilities of dealing with weaning and weaning stress. Uh, Dr. Noyes also did a great job of talking about, you know, you know, some of the issues at hand and and things we need to think about when you know, when we're looking at mitigations of antibiotic resistance, you know, it's fairly ubiquitous. You know, antibiotic resistance was widespread even before we started using antibiotics and animal agriculture, even for human health. It is very, very complex. Um, it's, it can be highly variable, both in time and space. And we've seen that with a number of studies where we're trying to look at antibiotic resistance within production systems. And even if we were to remove antibiotic use in animal, animal agriculture, antibiotic resistance would not completely disappear. Uh, as, you know, from a, a professional standpoint of view, you know, antibiotic resistance is something that has slowly increased with time as we've used antibiotic resistance. And it's not just going to completely disappear, uh, but there are mechanisms that we need to discover to help mitigate some of those increases and help bring that antibiotic resistance back down to lower levels. So some targets, you know, that we have been looking at here at Clay Center with the colleagues, with my colleagues. Uh, the, the main thing is, is to, since I was started first 
with the nutrition unit are ways to eliminate or reduce antimicrobial use. That was the most straightforward go that, that we could have. And in the swine operations, you know, one of the uh, greatest periods of concern was that nursery phase uh, because of weaning in the U.S. currently, you know, at Clay Center here specifically and around the country, we are weaning somewhere around 21 days of age. This is a high stress period. Uh, pigs are being removed from the mothers. They're being commingled with other litters. Uh, there's a lot of social structure that's having to be uh, redone. Um, and and those pigs, that's a very stressful time for those piglets. That's that's affecting a lot of their healthiness. It's also a transition from a liquid to a solid diet. They're going from milk uh, to, uh, to solid feed. Uh, although there are some incidences where people may use some slurries or fermented feeds in these piglets. Uh, but what we use here at Clay Center and what you, you see a lot in the U.S. is particularly a solid meal type or a pelleted diet. And then, you know, more importantly, you know, we're transitioning from a highly digestible uh, protein, carbohydrate, energy sources uh, that the in the milk to more plant-based diets that the animal's guts haven't really uh, been fully adapted to, to seeing at the time. So antibiotics are and historically had been used or antimicrobials have been used to help with some of this transition. The other thing in swine is some of the metaphatic, metaphylactic and prophylactic uses. That's something that we haven't really touched on with some of the research here uh, in the swine production systems, but it's something we would like to look at uh, somewhere down the road. And cattle, uh, we have been picking up or doing a lot more uh, working with alternative antibiotics and understanding some of the antibiotic resistance that's occurring at, at certain times in these production systems. Uh, with the cattle, the shipping receiving to the feedlot, particularly these cattle that are prone to bovine respiratory disease, that's where there's a lot of antimicrobial use for as a metaphylaxis and then also a therapeutic treatment afterwards, trying to understand what is going on and how we can mitigate some of that. And then uh, the other point you know, within cattle is controlling liver abscesses. We historically have used uh, Thailand in this country for controlling liver abscesses. Uh, it is still used because it is helping improve the animal health. Uh, but, you know, we're looking at some alternatives to, to uh, removing this, this use. And once again, you know, while, you know, the primary goal is to, you know, reduce antibiotic use while sustaining and maintaining the, the production that we currently enjoy in this country. Uh, I'll go back to one of the first studies that we did. Uh, and this was one uh, I first, you know, discussed with Dr. Yin when I came to Clay Center uh, near 20 years ago, and it large extract. This is a commercialized product uh, that has been extracted from the American larch tree. It's rich in arabinogalactan, which we you know, were viewing as being potential prebiotic. It also contains a flavonoid compound that could be an antioxidant. We designed a series of studies to look at zero and then inclusion rates of 1,000, 2,000 ppm of the large extract in the diet. And as a positive control, we used the carbidox carposulfate, which at that time was the current practice back at Clay Center and was used predominantly by many producers in the US. Carbidox has uh, some uh, issues uh, relative to within, within for, foreign governments allowing its use. Uh, and at that point in time, though, Carbidox was, was readily used in the U.S. In this study, we first did a trial with a ground mill, and looking at results, we decided to do something with a pelleted mill, uh, a pelleted diet, and that was trial two. And we mon monitored performance, commensal populations, and pathogen prevalence. I'll start with some of the results that we had uh, first with microbial populations. Uh, when we fed lactobacillus, we had, uh, and if you'll look on your left-hand side, you know, those are results, those bars, the darker bars are for the ground meal, the, the uh, gray bars on the uh, right-hand side are for the pelleted meal. Uh, when we fed the ground meal, ground meal uh, the large extract had numerical increases, but not statistically different increases uh, for the lactobacillus populations in the gut. When we added, um, when we added or when we pelleted uh, the diet with large extract, uh, then we did see some significant increases. When we looked at the E. coli populations, uh, we did not see any effect of large extract up on the, uh, up on the uh, E. coli populations uh, within the feces. Uh, one interesting thing uh, about this was that the carbidox copper sulfate uh, did lower 
our lactobacillus counts and did result in higher E. coli counts. And another component of the study, you know, since we did look at pathogens, salmonella wasn't impacted by diet, but carbidox and copper sulfate did significantly reduce campylobacter. Uh, looking at the performance matrices uh, from the studies, uh, there was no significant effect on gain. And uh, while we, uh, uh, but there was a significant impact on feed intake. And I'll concentrate mostly on the gain to feed. Uh, in both trials, uh, the uh, carbidox copper sulfate did reduce our, uh, our feed efficiency, our gain to feed. But when we did the pelleting of the diet, we did see a benefit of the large extract to improving the feed efficiency uh, for these piglets. Uh, so from this first study, just quickly uh, summarize, you know, it does appear that, you know, there may be usefulness for prebiotics. Uh, processing of the diet, such as pelleting, can have an impact on the results. Uh, one thing that we started looking at was the flavonoids generally regarded as uh, beneficial. Uh, these can have bitter flavors, and there was concern from some of the results that we were seeing whether or not it, particularly in a nursery pig, it be, could be reducing the feed intake. And uh, one thing in particular from the study, while we saw some benefits from the large extract, we also saw that carb the carbidox copper sulfate combinations were significantly increasing E. coli, but they also significantly reduced Campylobacter. Uh, with time, we moved to another compound, and this is lysozyme, and this has been published as well. Uh, here is an enzyme that degrades peptidoglycan, naturally found in many of the mammalian secretions. And we, and there was some preliminary work that wanted to look, where they looked at intestinal morphologies, microbiology, and metabolite profiles. And with this, we designed a study to determine if, if uh, diets with and without, and with being 100 ppm of a commercial lysozyme product, would improve the performance and reduce pathogen shedding in uh, early wing piglets. And here we used a 10 day piglet. Uh, that we put on liquid diets. As a positive control, we used neomycin and oxytetracycline supplementation, which was uh, done uh, with early weaned piglets at the time. And we monitored performance, intestinal parameters, uh, and pathogens in this study. Uh, so uh, looking at some of the, uh, the with early weaned piglet performance, uh, we did see some differences in average daily gain. Uh, we did see uh, differences uh, compared to the basal, the control diet with average daily feed intake, but no differences in, in the gain to feed. Looking at the average daily gain, the, the primary uh, benefit we saw here was that both lysozyme and our antibiotic combinations were increasing uh, the average daily gain, which is a useful uh, metric and particularly when we looked at the, the last week of the study and the full component or the full two weeks of the study, lysozyme was nearly as effective, if not effective, as effective as was the antibiotic combination. Uh, intestinal morphologies were something that we wanted to look at with this study. And what we found was that both the ileum and jejunum had improved uh, intestinal morphologies when we added both antibiotic and when we added lysozyme to the diets. So it was very apparent to us that lysozyme had the potential, like antibiotics would, to improve the gut health. So some of the conclusions from this early uh, study was that lysozyme could be as effective uh, as, as antibiotic combinations to improve performance. It also improved gastrointestinal health uh, I did not show this slide, you know, above, but, you know, one thing that we did see with the lysozyme is it did significantly reduce Campylobacter shedding in feces compared to the negative control. So there were two other studies we did, and here we went into the nursery phase of production. Uh, study one was a dietary comparison, and these were piglets weaned at 24 days of age. Here we used a positive control of carbidox copper sulfate. Study two, we used immune challenge type of study. Uh, here, the piglets were weaned at 26 days of A, and we used as a positive control. Uh, the industry was starting to ship, shift to a chlorotetracycline tiamulin phosphate study at the time, and so that's what we used as our positive control. Uh, we assess, assess both performance morphologies, intestinal morphologies, and some pathogens. I will just briefly talk about some of the average, you know, the performance uh, parameters that we had from this study. Uh, when we fed the antibiotics, 
before when we fed the lysozyme, once again, we see the biggest benefits, you know, at the second half of the feeding phase and also benefits over the overall production cycle uh, by using lysozyme uh, compared to either the antibiotic or the control and also the antibiotic supplementation. Uh, we also saw uh, some differences compared to the control diet uh, for both antibiotics and our lysozyme for having better feed efficiency and, and also improving uh, intestinal morphologies, which I haven't shown in this, state, this study. Uh, lysa, uh, experiment four, uh, here's some uh, where we compared it to chlorotetracycline and thiamine phosphate, average daily gains were significantly affected, particularly in the last half and overall for both antibiotic and lysozyme. And that was true for whether the animals were in a clean nursery or a dirty nursery. And one of the other parameters that we estimated from this um, to show what it, the impact would be on producers are the days to market. And when we, particularly when we were in the dirty uh, nursery or those immuno-challenged uh, piglets, uh, they, we saw a much more improved use or a performance and a shorter time to market uh, by almost five days uh, for piglets that were getting lysozyme compared to those controlled piglets. So here it was very apparent that lysozyme was as effective as the, uh, as the antibiotic control. Uh, Campylobacter, uh, we did this in our production systems and we had the capabilities at this point in time to look at Campylobacter prevalence uh, for both our control diet and our uh, Chlorotet, uh, thiamine phosphate antibiotic diet, we saw increases as we went through, you know, the production through the nursery phase for Campylobacter. However, uh, when we uh, looked at uh, the uh, the lysozyme treatment, uh, we did not see that increase. So it does look like lysozyme has the potential to uh, reduce Campylobacter prevalence uh, during the nursery phase. Uh, so a few other studies that we've been doing uh, with swine, uh, we have looked at the potential for a lactos lactobacillus acidophilus fermentation product uh, to improve performance and reduce pathogens. This was a ATA project funded from headquarters. Uh, this was in collaboration with, William, well, William Oliver was lead PI in collaboration with Lisa Durso at Lincoln. We have conducted two studies. Uh, from both studies, uh, the fermentation product did improve uh, performance compared to negative control. Uh, There's also some information that Lisa uh, gleaned from some of the data that there was a reduced abundance of some of the re uh, TET resistant genes. And we also saw particularly in the second study, uh, the capabilities for this fermentation product to reduce Campylobacter prevalence. Uh, another study that we have been working with, uh, this William Oliver and myself with uh, Katie Summers, who is at Beltsville, uh, we were looking at the abilities of this fungal species, Castania, uh, to improve performance, reduce pathogen shedding in nursery swine. Uh, Katie has done quite a bit of work with this in the older pigs. We wanted to look at something within a nursery phase. Uh, the data to, to this date doesn't look like we see, you know, up on the fungal species supplementation on performance or changes in shedding. But one thing that was very apparent, this is the first time in our hands that we had actually started enumerating AMR populations in these piglets. And what was very uh, significant from that is that compared to what it, cattle production systems where I don't really see a lot of innumerable uh, antibiotic resistance for, particularly for the cotton CTX until the animals are older, uh, our piglets in the nursery all were innumerable for not just the tetracycline, but cot and CTX resistant E. coli populations as well. So we may have to start reimagining before we start doing some mitigation, maybe something in the farrowing or in the uh, uh, gestation barns with the sows themselves. Uh, we have been doing some stuff with bovine respiratory disease and high risk cattle. This was a collaboration. Uh, we, cl uh, we were uh, looking at uh, salmonella in these uh, in the study with West Texas A&M University. Uh, one of the things that come from this, we looked at both a bacillus subtilis and a chromium propionate supplementation, or they were looking at that to improve animal health. Didn't really report a lot of impact on animal health, but one thing that we did see was that supplementation of the bacillus subtilis product did reduce fecal salmonella shedding. Uh, I have shown the table here. Uh, those are the the raw counts, uh, average raw counts for fecal counts, salmonella uh, for the animals that we had. 
own study. So uh, bacillus cellulis seems to have a significant impact on salmonella shedding. Uh, we've also been looking, uh, this is a study that's ongoing. Uh, some of the preliminary data is being published right now. Uh, bovine respiratory disease, cattle in Texas, uh, in collaboration with Kristen Hill's lab at Texas Tech University. Uh, we had been talking a little bit about how we could do some targeted metaphylaxis. And one of the ideas is that we could do rectal temperature with cattle at receiving. Uh, we decided to add up on that is like, let's look at eye temperature. Uh, it may be something where it'd be more hands off to identify sick cattle, see if we can get a good correlation to rectal temperature and use these metrics as a method of reducing antibiotic use or metaphylactic use on these cattle at receiving. Uh, both uh, mechanisms basically, or both uh, of these uh, interventions reduce metaphylactic use by 50%. Rectal temperature helped reduce an total antibiotic use by 43% compared to conventional uh, total metaphylaxis to the herd. The ocular uh, or eye temperature uh, wasn't nearly as effective. Uh, a lot more sick animals kind of uh, got through the screening process, but I think at the time, this is something that we could reduce. Uh, we've been doing some stuff with cattle, identifying the alternatives to tylosin to control liver abscesses. I'll just briefly talk about a couple of things. Limiting feeding trial, while there was a lot of promise for limiting, to, you know, it had been shown to inhibit Fusobacterium necroforum, which is one of the agents that causes liver abscesses. However, when we did a, a study with this, we did not see any reduction in liver abscesses. So it did not appear that this, uh, this citrus product would be useful. We've also been working in collaboration with the University of Nebraska Lincoln to identify some, or to work with some probiotic strains that they have identified. They have found many of these strains to be inhibitory to Fusobacterium necroforum. Uh, we there's some questions here. You know, you have to feed out, figure out uh, dosage levels and things like that. In some of the preliminary work, we haven't been able to uh, see these reductions in liver abscesses, but a lot of that work is still ongoing. So, you know, to summarize some of the stuff, it does appear that we have the possibility to reduce antimicrobial use in nursery swine uh, with alternatives antibiotics. Uh, lysozyme was very, very effective uh, in our hands. The big thing here is that we need a reliable supply that we could use for all production systems. Uh, there's also the possibility to reduce antimicrobial use control uh, that's being used to control bovine respiratory disease using targeted magnifaxis. Uh, this ocular infrared imaging is promising, but it needs further study and a lot more bugs to be worked out. And then alternatives to tylus and control liver abscesses, that has remained elusive to us, us to, so far. But part of the incident, the problem here is that even when you feed Thailand, you don't completely eliminate liver abscesses. You just reduce the overall incidence. And many of the studies, we have had very low incidence. So some of these, uh, these probiotics that we could have been using may be effective if if liver abscesses is a much higher incidence. So with that, I'd like to thank, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak and also acknowledge the many collaborators that we have at Mark, Lincoln, Bark within ARS, my collaborators at University of Nebraska, Lincoln, West Texas A&M for the studies that have been published and current collaborations with Kristen Hells and her students in particular, Taylor Smock, who is doing this uh, camera work as well as was the, was the person who led that research uh, with the Bacillus product. Uh, with that, I take any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Wells. Um, we are a little bit over time and we are at a break right now. So we're going to take um, a five minute break. So until 11.05 Eastern time, and then we will come back and we have a nice 40 minutes um, for panel discussion, Q&A, um, to discuss the, the four talks that we just heard. So we'll see you in a few minutes at 11.05 Eastern. <clears throat>
Okay, welcome back everybody from the break. Uh, we're going to get started with our panel discussion. It looks like we don't have any open questions in the Q&A. So I just want to remind everybody listening today that uh, the best way or the only way to ask questions is to type into the Q&A box there at the bottom of your Zoom set, uh, of your Zoom. And we will then see your questions and I'll be sure that it gets directed to the correct speaker. Uh, we do have some questions here uh, that we've prepared to get us started during this panel discussion. Uh, and I want to start with a question um, for the panel at large, but we'll start with Dr. Ola Dende. Um, you talked a lot about direct fed microbials in, in poultry production, and you had some really um, nice data sort of showing how you've screened for potential um, microbes that can be included in the feed. Um, and there were actually several steps to that screening process, including looking at sort of the whole genome sequencing of those potential um, direct fed mi microbes um, and their, um, their mobile genetic element profile, their ability to uh, undergo conjugative transfer with other, with other bacteria. And so I'm wondering, um, since you've done so much work in this, in this area, what are your main concerns regarding the application of these direct fed microbials in food animal production um, and how do you go about trying to alleviate some of those concerns when you're trying to identify um, potential direct fed microbes? Thank you for that question. Um, I think my main concern goes back to <clears throat> the, the ability of some of this probiotics that is currently being used in, in, in animal production to actually be a reservoir for antimicrobial resistance. There are a couple of studies that have that recently have shown that some of these probiotics that we are using, that they have the potential or to be to transfer um, antimicrobial resistance to some commensal bacteria in, in the gut. So my so go, the major like that's I would say that's my major concern is we doing a bit of a thorough job of trying to identify that does these probiotic strains do if they get into the chicken gut or get to animal or humans do they have the ability to become, so it doesn't, it's, it's not like, so we are not playing this, this game of a whack-a-mole that they do not, they're not a problem. We're not increasing the AMR, AMR problem. For us, what we're trying to do to alleviate that concern is to do in-depth, in-depth analysis. So apart from we're doing this OMG in, in silico analysis of whole genome sequencing, what we're actually also doing, what we are planning on doing in the lab also is that we are trying to mimic, to try to test that out. So we are doing this experiment where we have our own, our own, our own strains, looking at other strains and then exposing them to a commensal population and seeing if the commensal population picks up anything from our own probiotics. We are doing that in the lab. We're also going to do it with the animal, with the trials too, to just be sure that the strains that we're using, they do not become a reservoir of antimicrobial resistance. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Uh, do any of the other panelists want to um, address that question as well? You know, a follow up to that um, last week's or the last webinar that was hosted in this series, um, I, I went and watched it and they talked a lot about one of the major data gaps right now being uh, a more comprehensive understanding of the likelihood that certain bacteria bacteria pairs will undergo um, horizontal gene transfer. Um, and so, you know, in these controlled studies, you can look at you know, bacteria X and bacteria Y and how likely, the, how likely that um, conjugation is. Um, but it's very hard to do that for all of the uh, bacterial species and strains that are going to be present within, you know, a, an actual real microbiome in sort of quote unquote, the real world. And those transfer rates are, are really lacking within the literature. And I'm wondering if any of the panelists um, have thought about that challenge or thought about ways that we can um, overcome that data gap potentially. I guess I can chip in on that. Um, I think one thing we now know with this, with this introduction of all metagenomics and all this um, next generation sequencing technology is that it is I think we can, we're getting closer to being able to do that. I guess what I mean by that is if I, 
we can we, we there are ways we can have macro strains or macro genetic elements that we inoculate to the birds or into a mouse model and we can track that through time we can track that using at least to some extent we can track that using metagenomics to identify what 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 bug there's this technology called ic technology that actually helps you that tells you who is the recipient who is the donor and can able to capture that so the, I think that's one way we can we can kind of solve some of that problem is using this I I C technologies that tells you where the, the where the, the uh, which bacteria in a, in this old microbiome which rest which bacteria species or bacterial strain actually acquired a, a, a plasmid or antibiotic resistance gene. Great, um, I have a question for Dr. Abekwe. Um, when you talked about your greenhouse study, there were um, three specific antibiotics that you tested. I believe it was trimethoprim, sulfamidoxazole, and I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the third one, but I'm wondering um, what your motivations were for choosing those three specific antibiotics. Um, we choose those three antibiotics because uh, when we did our suspect screening with the wastewater that we use for the greenhouse, study we wanted to have a target we just didn't want to use any particular antibiotics so we wanted to make sure that we use the antibiotics that is at least in that waste water so we did a big suspect uh, screening with lcms to to look at all the contaminants that we have the different contaminants that we have in the wastewater and uh, only those three antibiotics were identified from that wastewater and they were identified at very low concentrations so that's how we use that antibiotics those three antibiotics uh, for the study since they were already there in the wastewater and we know that we can also spike those antibiotics in our study to get a higher level of the concentrations. When you did that screening, how did the concentration of those antibiotics in the wastewater compare to the concentrations that you used for the spike in? Um, the concentration in the wastewater were actually less than one um, ppb, whereas well, there were about one ppb, whereas the what we spike, we use a 10 ppb and a 100 ppb. We just wanted to make sure that we have enough <laughs> to find, to see the movement or the dissemination of these antibiotics in the soil, plants, and the whole continuum. Because our hypothesis was really, okay, this is some raw areas. You're not going to have wastewater that are this clean, that there are processes in the way that you don't have all. That in some rural areas, you may have a lot of contaminants in the wastewater. You may have a lot of antibiotics, or even you may have these three antibiotics at a very higher at a higher concentration. So that was why we spike it and see what happens once you have it at a higher concentration and even in some developing countries you have these antibiotics at a higher concentration and at the same time they use wastewater to grow food thank you um, any follow-up questions um, on the greenhouse study from other panelists or from the audience Uh, one question I had also for you, Dr. Abekwe, is um, for the biochar, I, I'm not, I, I know the name <laughs> um, and I know it has some very interesting properties, but I'm not familiar with how it's produced. And when you showed that, um, you know, the 800 degrees Celsius, I just sort of thought, wow, that's, that's a really high temperature and probably requires a lot of um, like inputs to produce the biochar. Can you describe that process and like what the requirements are for actually producing the biochar? No, it doesn't actually improve a lot of uh, input. I think uh, might produce it under nitrogen or something like that. We have a small machine that is actually 
that we use in the producing that is actually very, very energy efficient. So that is how uh, Mike and Dan, how they are producing that. It's just the small equipment is up on the bench. They just move these things through and um, they run it through 800 degrees. Some of them, they run it through 600. Some of them, they run it through 400. Because the pyrolysis temperature yeah. actually plays a very significant part in uh, how these compounds are absorbed into the biochar material, which is something that we are actually very, very excited about in that part of the study because we've actually seen some real time result that is very, very effective with so many antibiotics. And one thing I did not mention during that process is that uh, we hoping to move this out to the field very soon. And some of the UC extension people have already talked to some people from uh, Los Angeles County and San Diego County, because those people are very, very interested in the organic farming. When they say it's completely organic, so they want something that they can really say something like that. Yeah, and on a related question we have in the chat here, um, how did you choose the raw material for the biochar? Well, we have a lot of uh, pistachio shells here. We have a lot of uh, dairy manure. We have a lot of uh, palm leaves all here in South California. So these are all local materials and these are waste. So if we can turn this waste into something useful, um, that's the best. So that's basically how we choose these materials. But we know that some of the plant-based materials like pistachio shells and the palm leaves, they have a higher absorption capacity to antibiotics than uh, some of the dairy, uh, manure based voucher. So we play around with that and we are run so many different analyses to see which of these will be the best for what we're planning to do out in the field. Thank you. Uh, we have a question for Dr. Wells. Um, is the commercial fermentation product that you mentioned well characterized, for instance, ingredients in that product, et cetera? Uh, to our knowledge, yeah, the company that has it uh, has um, has done a lot of research with it and has characterized what's in the product. Um, now, since it is proprietary, I don't think they've quite listed everything on their uh, on the feed sheets that come with it. But uh, to everything that we, re you know, the in our discussions with them, it has been it has been characterized. So, okay, thank you. Um, one thing that struck me um, during the talks is um, this idea of uniformity. Uh, I loved seeing the videos and pictures um, from Dr. Zhu because the rows of crops were just so beautifully uniform, and the equipment could go through that and you know do the directed spray in sort of a very uniform manner. Um, when we talk about microbial populations, I feel like the uniformity is not there at all, right? Um, so we have just a lot of variability in the microbial populations and uniformity is, a, I think, is a friend of farmers and a friend of producers. Uniformity makes things a lot easier um, and it makes production more efficient. Uh, so when we're dealing with something that's so non-uniform, um, i.e. The, the bacteria and the microbes, um, that to me is a big challenge um, when talking about AMR and, and mitigation strategies at that level. Um, and I, you know, I'm wondering if the panelists have thought about that, how, how, what's the best way to tackle that non-uniformity? Is it to almost move to like a personalized medicine approach where, you know, every farm or every population has their own um, set of microbes and we we tailor uh, our, our interventions to that specific population? Or is it that we should try to make the populations more uniform, which we've done sort of on the host genetic side, right? Um, so 
those two approaches, what do the panelists think about that and, and the challenge of non-uniformity? <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. And also, we are also toward in to that direction for future research now. And also all like insect disease or uh, the microbial bacteria uh, in the fields are randomly distributed. <clears throat> to, because uh, right, right now, the te sensor technology is not there yet to uh, accurately de detect where they are. So uh, to minimize, uh, to maximize the probability to uh, control of them, means the uniformity of uh, spray of chemicals or, or agrochemicals or, or uh, other uh, the, uh, foliar products, means it's a uniform applying them to, uh, to crops. That's the best way to minimize <clears throat> uh, missing them. So, uh, but our future, uh, even now, uh, of the uh, research direction is toward uh, using advanced technology to, uh, to pinpoint where are these <clears throat> pests and disease and bacteria are and then specifically apply that location. So you're taking sort of the precision route. So trying to, to detect where the non-uniformity is and then apply in a targeted way. Correct, correct. Yeah, that's okay. the, the direction. So yeah. all, all the current re research objectives now. Okay. Um, if I can chip in a little bit on that, going back to uniformity um, and talking about having a tailored approach for each, each farm or each production if you think about broiler production where you have some people some farms doing conventional where they're using make antibiotic copper metals then you have some doing no antibiotics everywhere they're not using anything similarly you have some people that reuse their litter from flock to flock while some people they clean up after every flock and use fresh pine for your shavings so my point today is that i think the approach here is going to be like a tailored approach for each because i don't think what happens with this integrator is going to work for this other integrator what happens on this farm is going to happen on the other farm so i think we need to especially for chicken production i think is that you yeah you need a multi-order approach at the same time you might need some tailored interventions for what works on your farm or your own production system I'm just going to add a little bit to that, and especially to what the Dr. Zhu said, because I'm kind of very jealous with, uh, of our guys here in our lab, the soil physics guys. What they do is that they go out to the soil and look at soil properties, and look at soil texture, and look at all those properties, look at soil salinity. and. Uh, before they used to go there and get soil samples, bags of soil samples and go and do all those measurements. But now they're using precision agriculture, combining that with artificial intelligence to figure out most of those and train their instrument based on precision agriculture to understand some of these soil properties. And uh, they are actually working out a system that in the next maybe five, 10 years, people will not have to go out to the field and collect a lot of soil samples and begin to do a lot of analysis in the lab to look at properties, to look at texture and all those soil properties. So I think maybe in terms of AMR, that in the future, that is probably where some of these technologies will be moving to. And I can remember very well the a presentation that was given during the during our last ARS uh, conference. A guy from uh, MIT actually talked exactly about using some of this uh, precision agriculture, artificial intelligence to train our system so that we don't do a lot of everyday lab analysis, but we are able to figure out exactly how and where to do a precise measurement. Yes, correct, yes. So that's what we uh, agriculture engineers are doing now. They use all kinds of tools, precision tools to detect the, the 
crop symptoms, soil properties. It's even uh, NASA also have a satellite uh, uh, for use of now. Means use satellite to uh, detect the soil moisture, soil temperature, and some even now it's working on soil microbial uh, uh, detection too. So and also for us, we also use uh, spectral microscope uh, scope uh, camera and also a lidar uh, sensor and also uh, all kind of uh, the sensor technology combine them together to um, do this kind of you know, detection measurement and also to uh, in the in, in the AI uh, that's cut, uh, intelligent uh, decisions and accumulate uh, uh, collect the historic uh, the data and then to find the trends. So all kind of tools we are uh, working on now to, to find a goal is to pinpoint where we need to apply chemicals or where apply fertilizers or where we should apply anti uh, bacterial anti uh, microbial uh, agents. So that's uh, is the goal right now. That means uh, I said the technology is still, since the technology is still not there yet, uh, we, uh, we are working on this, uh, this technology now. Thank you. Um, we have uh, some questions in the, in the chat. So first, Dr. Beckway, make sure you read the Q&A um, box there because there's someone who's interested in potential collaboration. Uh, which is great. That's one of the goals of these webinars, I think, is to connect researchers. Um, there is a question for Dr. Ola Dende. Uh, you mentioned that one of the houses um, had the higher prevalence of Salmonella type of Miriam, and the other house had a higher prevalence of Infantis. Any idea why? Yeah, that was a striking um, observation that each house was restricted to what stereotype, like house four has Salmonella type of Miriam house to house infantis. And I, I cannot, in terms of the management, I cannot say if there's any management factor that plays a role there. But my hypothesis is, is that um, I, I guess, I don't want to say they cannot coexist, that as soon as type of Miriam established, it, established itself in house four, it's kind of hard for infantis to intrude. And, odd, and similarly with, the, with, uh, with house two, infantis established itself first, and type of Miriam cannot compete or or kind of um, overtake it. So, but what you find interesting with the Kentucky is that they were in the same pop where the, we had the same prevalence for Kentucky, but for those two, it seems there is this competition between Typhimurium and Infantis that makes them go separate ways. So that's my, that would be my microbiology or the, my genetics understanding of it. But in terms of management or maybe different out, age of the houses or anything, I, because we did not see differences between the pH we didn't see differences in moisture in between houses or relative humidity or temperature. Most of those things were uniform across both houses. So the only thing I can think about is the genetics of Typhimurium and the genetics of um, Infantis. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is a theme where um, even when you try to control for many things, the, the microbial population can evolve uh, in different trajectories, right? And it's almost that stochastic process that's so hard to predict. Um, and I saw that also in one of Dr. Wells's results where I think you, you had mentioned that in like the first study, you didn't see the effect, but in the second one you did. Um, and I'm wondering there, Dr. Wells, I can't remember the exact um, intervention that was being investigated, but I'm wondering if you have any ideas why it sort of the effect was there in one study and not, not the next one. So that was when we did that first study with large extract and uh... You know, Dr. Yin, who uh, was a nutritionist, and I, we had numerous discussions, you know, why the pelleted diet gave us a, uh, a benefit to the lactobacillus, but, the, uh, but we did not see the same with the meal diet. And the only thing we could think of is that maybe the pelleted diet, even though there is some temperature involved with that, it maybe protected the, the uh, composition of the feed, uh, particularly the prebiotic, uh, more so than the meal diet did. Uh, you know, we would love to have, you know, done some additional research, but at that time we had other priorities that, that needed to be addressed. So we never did follow up on, on some of those questions, but it, it, that does get back into that precision animal thing, you know, the diet, diet composition, how you feed the diet, 
the genetics of the animal, the genetics of the pathogen, all of those are going to play big roles in what the observations are for each of the studies and what we'll see in different production systems. So, Thanks. Uh, we have a question here. Um, one of the speakers spoke about the potential use of Bacillus valen valensis for uh, management of antimicrobial resistance in animal systems. Uh, this species is studied also in plant health studies as biological control agents and plant resistance induction. Have any of the strains of this species used in plant health studies been evaluated in animal production systems? Um, I, I, I'm aware of the that there are some biocontrol, commercial biocontrol um, products made of um, that is composed of B. valensis. I do not know if they've been used in animals. Um, I do know that there is a, this, I forgot the name of this company made, they, they have this probiotics called Coralink that they use for animal. Um, I think it's Elanco. Elanco does have a, a probiotic called Coralink that they first, I think was first misidentified as B. subtilis. Then they revised it to B. valensis. So there is, a, there is a product called Coralink that has been produced by Elanco that they use that for animal species as a, as a probiotic. Great, thank you. Um, we also have a comment here where um, one of the attendees um, is commenting that they've been seeing an increase um, in Salmonella infantis prevalence in animal feed. Um, so has anyone, any of the panelists looked at feed as a source of um, resistant bacteria? It's a, feed is a big um, issue right now, of course, with viruses and in swine production. Um, but I guess on the bacterial side, has anyone been looking at feed as a source of resistance? Uh, so Noel, I'll, uh, we haven't looked at, um, so we have looked at some of the feed components and some of the feeds in our cattle study. Um, you know, you know, it, it's not surprising that things like, um, silage, corn silage carries a lot of enterococcus and antibiotic resistant enterococcus, uh, more so than components like corn or any of the supplements that we buy commercial when we're, when we're making our, our cattle feeds. Uh, so typically when we have seen it, it has usually been in those, those feed stuffs that are coming directly from the environment, at least in the cattle production. We haven't looked at it in our swine production uh, diets, but on the cattle production side, we're seeing some some things coming in with those components of the feed that are being harvested in the environment, uh, like silage, like haze, haylages, things like that, uh, seem to be where we're seeing some some minor levels of resistance, particularly within the intercaucus. Not so much with E. coli, but with the intercaucus. Interesting. Um, talking about plants a little bit. Um, uh, Dr. Beckley, I believe it was, talked about um, the, uh, had like a, a figure on, on metagenomic results um, comparing the spinach and the radish and the different soils with earthworms and not. And I think that one of the takeaways was that there was sort of a, a, a higher diversity of antimicrobial resistance genes within the spinach, um, the spinach associated samples. Um, compared to the radish. But the other thing I noticed within that plot was that it seemed like the profile of resistance genes was also different. So there was more, I think, potentially beta-lactam resistance genes in the spinach-associated treatments compared to the radish, which seemed to have more, um, I can't remember what the color was on that right-hand side of the chart, but I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit and why you think there may be differential um, persistence of certain types of antibiotic resistance genes between the two um, plant types? I think the, the difference, I think one of the main difference reasons is that the spinach just have the ability to take up a lot of compounds than uh, radish. So it's a function of the spinach uh, roots that because it's well spread inside this the pot and was able to basically get as much as possible that is available in that pot. Whereas the radish, um, it has only one tap root that goes into the soil 
and that taproot is not well spread inside that particular soil. So the spinach system is able to get as much of the chemicals that you have in the soil uh, samples than what you have in the radish uh, uh, soil sample. And uh, this was basically the trend that we saw uh, throughout the studies. And you have more antibiotic resistant genes or more classes of antibiotics being taken up by spinach than uh, by radish. I just think it's a function of root distribution. And do you think that that root structure and the root distribution, like for some reason, impacts different genes differentially? So that there's some sort of select, like differential selection of antibiotic resistance genes or, or the bacteria carrying them because of the root I, structure? Well, I think maybe it's a function of exposure of the different root system that you have. Uh, I, that is one of the things that uh, we're thinking here that is probably because the spinach has a very broad root system and is able to get as much as possible from all uh, from the from the soil that is i think that is probably one of the main reasons we we one thing that the additional thing that we are working on this is that uh, we're looking at the high throughput uh, pcr in fact that is what we are doing now looking at a high throughput pcr basically looking trying to do about, do about 290, 295 assays to target this, all these genes. Then at the end, we're going to do some DDPCR to actually look at what happens in individual soil, whether these compounds are there and uh, the radish or the spinach root are just selective in the uh, them transporting it through the system. All right, in the last uh, few minutes here that we have, um, one uh, question that, that we have is, what do you think some of the, we've talked a lot about new technologies, um, whether that be in precision agriculture, artificial intelligence, um, molecular, uh, advanced molecular biology with things like HiC, et cetera. What do you think some of the key barriers are to developing technologies or maybe implementing technologies for the mitigation of antimicrobial resistance in agriculture? Well, you know, touching on some of the stuff we've seen with the ocular camera, uh, just the variability within the production systems and the animals themselves are are making it somewhat difficult. Now, with time, you know, we can, you know, collect the data, develop algorithms and things like that, particularly with the help of ag engineers, engineers and others who are uh, more adept at, at working with that type of data. Uh, but that's some of the things that we're running into is just, just the variation within the population um, and the, the variations across the production systems. When, on that ocular camera can affect uh, the result that you get. So just a little bit of a breeze behind you will change uh, the number that you see. Uh, so there's where you know, the production system itself can, it, you know, having things tailored to it and understanding that type of production system is going to be something we need to we need to un better understand in order to put these tools in producers' hands. I think that once with the help of all these new technologies, then once we have some good products that the farmers believe in, because the farmers always, their primary goal is to make profit. Once we have some of these tools that the farmers believe in and they see that is something that they can readily use and something that will not interfere in the operation, something that's easier easy to use and will be profitable i think with proper education um, 
most of the farmers who adopt the new technologies. Yeah, and all new technologies uh, are co costly. So for uh, uh, for if uh, let's say if you uh, want to pay high price, high cost, a lot of uh, uh, problems can be solved by new technologies. But the problem is this new technology in most cases a lot affordable by uh, by uh, farmers growers. That's that's the key issue. Just like our intelligent spray system, means we can do much much more uh, work uh, with, with this system technology and can uh, make it more precision and more advanced. But when we add more advanced, the growers cannot afford to buy them to use them. So they can use them, but cannot afford to buy them. So we have to reduce a lot of advanced features. Uh, in this, uh, for, for this technology for them to practically use. And uh, um, right now, uh, this uh, system can uh, widely used by large farmers. They can afford to, uh, uh, to, to, buy, to buy them. But for, uh, to, from uh, my personal view, small growers are more needed uh, more needed in this uh, technology because like the, uh, the pretty uh, vineyards or apple orchards or ornamental nurseries they are always uh, growing in a very beautiful neighborhood and also very sensitive areas but this farms are usually is very small and they cannot afford to buy this technology so uh, that's uh, the future. Uh, I think it's stretched to solve these problems. The government uh, subsidies or uh, public support you know, to help these growers to uh, use new technology. That's what I'm saying. The cost is the most barrier for uh, using new technology. Just I just, I, I, bacteria uh, yeah. action. There is the high tech the tech. You can have this a million dollars in equipment. You can do it. Can do it. But how many people can afford to buy it to use it? That's the problem. The call. Yeah. yeah. What I was gonna add in that discussion is that if we if we can step back a little bit and see that we're using all these compounds, antibiotics, because in the first place, we don't have healthy animals. We don't have healthy plants. We don't have healthy soil. If we can figure out a way, like all of us, like if, if, if we can figure out a way and get healthy plants, healthy animals, soil with high microbial diversity, yeah. then we will cut down on the use of some of these compounds. Okay. And that will save us a bunch of money. Like okay. for animals, maybe if we have good vaccine, then at the end, we're not gonna use uh, antibiotics once we produce healthy animals. Healthy plants, we're not gonna use antibiotics. And a healthy soil, a soil with a healthy microbial diversity, that is where we're going to produce because a soil with high microbial diversity will basically, with the help of that soil, those soil microbes, will outcompete those bad microbes that will be coming in. Yeah, also our. The multi uh, farm uh, trials also shows if you use nest uh, like fungicides, nest insecticides in the field, and then uh, after and you will have nest disease and nest insect problems in that field. That's because nest insect nest insecticide use nest fungicide use, and they will also. Uh, protect the beneficial insects and protect the beneficial fungus in on the soil. 
So beneficial fungus in soil against the, uh, the pest fungus. And then eventually the, the pest fungus uh, grow slower or have become less. And then the, field, the farm field will have um, less uh, pathogen uh, problem or, uh, or the fungus problem. So the, eventually they will use less pesticides to have more healthy crops. And so I think what's interesting about this discussion is that it highlights the fact that like a lot of these inter interventions um, are multifactorial, right? Um, they they not only impact potentially the, mi the microbes themselves and the resistance, um, but potentially these other factors that could be important. And right now, um, I, I believe within USDA and, and the larger government and within the research community, there's a lot of focus on sustainability of agricultural production, um, resiliency of agricultural production. And I'm wondering when you all are conducting your research, and a lot of it is focused on antimicrobial resistance as sort of that primary outcome that we're concerned about. Are you uh, accounting for or measuring some of these other um, things that could be impacted by the intervention like um, key sustainability uh, metrics um, or other performance indicators that might be um, associated with sustainability or resiliency? Um, it's something I've, I, I think about, I've been thinking about lately and it's not, I don't have a solution to it, but going back to the, the, the study where this farmer has been using the leader for 10 years old and we're still having this high prevalence of salmonella in there. The only thing I could think about at that point was, oh, I think you need to get rid of all this leader and start a fresh and clean the house. But the concern that was raised was that, what do you want me to do with the leader? Where am I gonna put it? You can see that in my shed over there, I already have leaders that I don't have anywhere to, to put it. So I think the, in terms of sustainability, if we could have a, a way where the leader can be reused apart from using it for applying it to, because I don't want, I don't think you should apply such a leader to the soil, but is there a way we can reuse such leader for right, production of energy for that the farmer can reuse or, and, and be able to use to eat up the house. But I think it's one thing that in, in broiler production system that we need to start investing more research and time into saying that what other ways can these farmers use their leader apart from applying, applying them as fertilizers, so, as fertilizers, especially if you think that they, this leader has a high abundance of antimicrobial resistant pathogens in them. Well, on, on our end, somebody like myself that works on uh, microbial ecology, specifically dealing with the soil, we always, one of the things that we always look at is soil health. If, if you have a healthy soil, that means there is going to be sustainability in the ag production. So if you don't have a healthy soil, um, you cannot sustain ag production. So whatever management that you are doing, you have to look at sustainability and make sure that you have a healthy soil environment to work in. What you're going to do is that you make sure that what you do is you improve your soil microbial diversity so that if there is a stranger coming in into that soil, that means a pathogen that is not supposed to be there. You have a larger community that can outcompete that pathogen so that that pathogen cannot come and invade that environment. So that is always the way to look at good soil health, whether you're doing composting or whatever means that you are doing. Once you maintain a good soil health, then you are able to carry on sustainable ag production. Does anyone else want to chime in on that? No? Okay. Well, we're, we're coming up on um, 12 o'clock here Eastern time. Uh, and so we're going to get wrapped up. I don't see any open questions in the Q&A, which is great. Um, and I'm just going to give a few very brief closing remarks to sort of recap what we talked about today. Um, I think um, one of the things that came across, especially during the panel Q&A, was sort of how do you 
how do you go about tackling these complex questions from a scientific approach point of view? And what we heard is, um, you know, a lot of work with um, people outside of maybe our specific research area. So um, Dr. Wells mentioned working with agricultural engineers with the temperature um, sensors, and then um, also working with subject matter experts who really understand the production systems that we're trying to mitigate within, right? Um, because they're so variable um, and because small differences in production or management can impact um, the efficacy of these um, interventions, it's really important to, to have those subject matter experts involved in the study, you know, sort of from start to finish probably. Um, so just a lot of um, need for interdisciplinary work in this area um, so that we can hopefully identify the most effective um, interventions in a, a hopefully a somewhat rapid manner. Um, another theme that I think came through was this idea of um, variability or non-uniformity. And that we found is definitely true at the level of microbial populations, but is also true um, across farms, uh, across management systems, um, and the way that people raise food. Uh, and I think um, dealing with this um, variability is one of, has come across as maybe one of the more challenging aspects of conducting this type of research. Um, we also talked a lot about uh, how to bring these interventions sort of into the real world, right? So how do we um, encourage adoption of some of these interventions um, if they do prove indeed to be effective in the lab. And that is also another challenging area, moving, moving these um, lab-based studies through that scientific process of you know, trying to generate the evidence in a more controlled setting, um, and then taking that piece of evidence and using it um, to design a larger study, maybe in a field-based setting. And then of course, ramping that up to commercial scale production capacities. That's uh, a very challenging um, process with uh, the, the likelihood of um, failure of that, that evidence transfer um, in, at many points along that chain, right? And so I think it was really great to see from the speakers today um, research that really spanned that spectrum. So all the way from controlled lab-based studies where you know we're looking at just two bacteria and how they interact all the way up to well, this technology has been employed in the field for 10 years now, right? So it's, it's great to see that range and gives everybody hope that um, this work we're doing eventually can find applied benefit. Um, I think we, we ended there on sort of understanding that antimicrobial resistance may be um, sort of inherently tied to other important um, environmental public health, animal and human health outcomes, such as sustainability and resiliency. Um, and trying to keep in mind that when we're doing these studies, um, there are other outcomes that maybe we want to be looking at as well as antimicrobial resistance to understand again, both those negative and positive unintended consequences of these different mitigation um, efforts that we're investigating. Um, I learned a lot today. Um, I did not know about earthworms or biochar or um, the pesticide application on trees. Um, and so I think it's great to get this diverse um, research um, view. And again, I think that that helps us um, also start to um, identify diverse research teams as well. So um, with that, uh, I think that we'll close out for the session today. The session will be available, um, the recording of the session will be, be available um, online. Uh, it was great to be here with everybody today, and um, I wish you all a great rest of your week.